I'd like to call to order the Monday, April 3rd special workshop meeting of the Birmingham City Commission. If you could all join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. And we'll hold just a minute or two before we take the roll. Therese, can you turn the eagle face out? Oh, yeah. Here we go. A bit better. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> If you're going to put it up there, you might as well put it up there properly. see Pierre out there, did you? <laughs> no. <coughs> I had my water leak all over the steps, so thankfully PD is doing so much to mop it up. <clears throat> all right. Uh, like I said, uh, Commissioner Bo Boutros notified us he's running a few minutes late. We understand that there was issues with traffic. We've already uh, called the meeting to order and uh, said the pledge. And now I'll ask um, for the first time City Cler Assistant City Clerk uh, Christina Woods to call the roll. Mayor Long? Here. Mayor Pro Tem McLean? Here. Commissioner Baller? Here. Commissioner Boutros? Here. Uh, Commissioner Host? Here. Commissioner Hag? Here. Commissioner Schaefer? Here. All right, thank you. So tonight's meeting is a special workshop meeting to discuss uh, the potential renovation of City Hall and uh, improved facilities for the Birmingham Police Department. And um, Commissioner Baller? I have a suggestion. <clears throat> Maybe a motion, if it's appropriate. I don't know if motions are appropriate. That we uh, hear the presentation on the phase one assessment report, but that we table uh, discussion presentation on phase two uh, basis of design report and uh, provide direction to the administration on a process for moving forward. Um, so, Ms. Kucherik, do we have motions in workshop sessions? You usually don't. Um, you don't take action. Yeah, you don't. You don't take formal action. If, but if this is a, a motion for how one want the commission wants to proceed, and it's in line with what your agenda shows, I don't think that that's a problem. Okay. So this is um, a motion for proceeding. Mm -hmm. that you want to make? Mm -hmm. So you just want to clarify process and how you think the process should go. Is that correct? Commissioner? Yes. Again, the motion is would be to uh, 
discuss the first report, the phase one assessment report, receive the presentation on that, but table the phase two basis of design report, do not receive a presentation, do not discuss that, but rather provide direction to the administration on a process for moving forward. Well, I think the public uh, was noticed that both would be discussed. <clears throat> depends on how long the first part takes, but it seems to me that you're cutting off, you're making a decision to cut off something before you've even gotten to it. And is there not also a tour as part of this? Yes. Okay. Um, so whether it's a mo if it's a motion, we can ask for a second. If it's not a motion, uh, I can continue with my comments. I don't really you care can, uh, what we do uh, uh, in that regard. So let's be less formal and we'll see how the meeting goes, <clears throat> but you're welcome to continue with a comment. Well, I don't think any of us were expecting a project of the scope and cost outlined in the second report. And given our limited time tonight, I think we should focus on the assessment report. And if we talk about anything further from that point, it should be the process that we use uh, for looking at solutions to the problems. Uh, for members of the public who might be watching online or on TV, I want to summarize the situation. Back in July, uh, the administration asked us to hire an architect to look at City Hall, both the, both the physical condition and how it functions, and to suggest improvements. Uh, this was prompted in part by recommendations made to the police department during its accreditation in 2021. City Hall is old and crowded, insecure, and a thorough assessment was long overdue, and the commission unanimously supported that move. Um, tonight's workshop packet contains two separate and distinct reports. The first is called the Phase 1 Assessment Report, and it's about the physical condition of City Hall and the significant functional challenges city staffers contend with every day. The second report, called the Phase 2 Basis of Design Report, proposes an ambitious solution. Now, as part of the request to hire the architect, the administration told the commission, and this is a direct quote, there will be no consideration of a new building or facility. The safety and security upgrades may be accomplished by potential renovations and or expansion of the existing building. <clears throat> so you can imagine the surprise when in January at the Long Range Planning Meeting the administration told us that a new b building was indeed being considered and then here in tonight's packet presented detailed concept designs for a new 27 million dollar building. I think if the administration had told us in July it was considering such a thing, my response at least personally would have been much different. I would have had a lot of concerns, especially about the process. But giving staff the benefit of doubt and suggesting that maybe a $27 million project was not foreseen, uh, I wonder why, as soon as it grew beyond what any of us expected, they would, didn't come to us. At that point, I would have said, let's hold the phone, talk about this. Um, I do take some responsibility, and I think some of us, all of us should, we should have realized that a $75,000 architectural contract could go this far. And we should have realized that a suggested design on the last, very last page of the architect's lengthy proposal for a two-story addition with underground parking could morph into something bigger. And that design, by the way, was the more elaborate of three design schemes promised in the architect's proposal. When we do talk about the design report, I think we want to know what happened to those three other design schemes. The bottom line is I think the architect's first report, which is very good, is more than enough to talk about tonight. We ought to digest that, and then we can talk about a process to explore potential solutions. One other thing we might talk about at some point is our experience on this project and others, and I think of the West Maple Fire Station and the North Old Woodward Development Proposal. 
suggest that we should talk about how the city engages with architectural and other firms on public projects. Um, I do want to address the police department and city hall staff. I'm sure they are aware of these reports and they should know that uh, the commission has learned a lot from them and I think we feel their pain and uh, I think we're committed or will be committed to easing it. Um, to the administration, I'm guessing you could tell I'm a little miffed at how this has unfolded. Um, the good news is I'll get over it, and I <laughs> hope we can right. just get to work on other options. Okay, so let's move into the introduction by City Manager Marcus. Before we do that, okay, <clears throat> I think there needs to be a setting the record straight. I don't know if I spoke to Mr. Baller about this or to you, Mayor Long, but when I heard this comment about the new building, I made it clear to one of you that the interpretation of that was entirely different than what the message was intended. And the message has a historical connection. Back in the early 1990s, when we looked at this building, the comment was, and the discussion was about, either renovating, which may have or may have not included expansion of this building, but not building a new facility elsewhere. That's what that reference is about. Correct. Had, there was no intention to suggest that we wouldn't add an addition onto this building. The distinction goes back to that historical reference that the commission and our public at the time would have n nothing okay, to do with a new city hall elsewhere. And the reality was we could have built a new city hall elsewhere, probably less expensive than what we were going to do and put into this building. That's where that came from. That's entirely what that meant. So whether it was Com conveyed completely, obviously it wasn't, or whether it was interpreted correctly, it wasn't. That was never the intent of those comments. So I hope that sets the record straight about where that came from. There was never an intention to suggest that we would build, not build something, an addition onto this building, which you can interpret as a new building but it was intended to say we wouldn't move off site. We learned our lesson 30 years ago when we did when we had that discussion. That's where that came from. Could you extrapolate about the off site? The lesson you learned 30 years ago about the off site? Oh sure. The 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 community would hear nothing of possibly building a new brand new city hall. Okay? And you know, when you look at a renovation of a facility, you look at alternatives, okay? You do look at alternatives, and we looked at alternatives in this. But the community did not want to lose this historic building, even if it meant really some very complicated construction and living in the construction. We all lived in this building during the reconstruction. We ended up with a very complicated contractor who was having all sorts of personal problems. And as a result, we went through multiple job superintendents when this was being done. <clears throat> the dust, the dirt, the moving around, the failure of power and equipment during all that, the trailers that we operated on. I imagine none of you remember any of that at that point. But that was a very definitive comment from the commission who heard from the public about that. That's what that comment referred to. 
and all it referred to. So. Let's let City Manager Marcus do his introduction, well, his presentation. <clears throat> May I please respond? I appreciate his response. And that is not what I based my decision on in July. I get that. Okay? Yeah. And I would like to hear the sense of the commission on whether we hear anything about the second report. Because that was that is what I asked and I think I deserve What what are that. you saying? I don't think we should be presented with or discuss the second report. If I may, it's, it's a workshop. <clears throat> it's just information. Okay, Commissioner Hay. Perhaps the best way of answering that, because I'm trying, I'm trying very hard to sit in the middle and hear both arguments, and I can respect both sides of the argument. We're 15 minutes into the workshop. Workshops in the past, you've heard me complain that there's an awful lot of presentation and not a lot of discussion. So I would suggest that we go into it, but the discussion flows as it needs to flow, as it happens. And if it takes longer to go through the first portion to understand it better, then so be it. And if we run out of time to go into the second, and if it means we actually stop early because we wouldn't have a robust discussion in the second phase, then stop early and then we do it. But I think we should let it organically flow at this point, but I have a feeling the first part is going to take a long time. And City Manager Marcus, is it first part and then tour and then second part? Yeah. I, I, is that, was that your plan, The, the Scott? tour is essentially the first part to go over the concerns, was the actual walking tour to see them. Okay. Any other response? I have no objection. It's information only today, workshop, so either or, either or I'm comfortable. Uh, With that, be, yeah. if I could make the introductory comments, but if you have other questions. Did you have, no, just, I would like to focus on the details of the assessment. That's the part I expected. That's what I would like to focus on because these deficiencies are the safety issues that we need to know, and, and that's how I would like to yeah. spend this time. I feel strongly about that, which the tour will, of course, highlight, which is... All right, prefer. let's proceed. Thank you. Okay. Marcus. So this building was built in 1928, meaning it's about 95 years old. I started in 1989. Um, I was born in 1951. Bob Kenning was first employed with the city in 1951. So Bob and I met um, uh, in 1989. And we had a bit of a crossover, just like occurring with Jan and myself at this particular time. The building was built in 1928. So in 1993, after living with the building for a few years, um, I looked at City Hall and I looked at DPS and I had this same kind of discussion with the City Commission way back then and we did a tour of both the City Hall and the DPS facility. So in 19, uh, let's see, oh, it was 93, we issued uh, bonds in the amount of about $18.4 million. And we retired some previous debt, which uh, uh, actually we uh, retired some previous debt, and we committed about $7.5 million to City Hall and to the DPS. Only two and a half million dollars was committed to the city hall back at that point. It's now 30 years later. Our systems are 30 years older. You can see some of the, you know, the ongoing maintenance issues, and that's what we'll walk around and show you. If you've re reviewed the status report, you have a sense about what you're probably going to see as we walk you around. Um, the DPS was quite an interesting building. I took him into the offices, the elected officials into the offices of the uh, DPS facilities were on a second level inside the barn. You could write your, your name on the walls from the carbon from the exhaust fumes that gravitated up to um, that location uh, in the building. So that's where the bulk of the money from the $7 million uh, went in terms of building <laughs> renovations, not 
not as much over here. Uh, those were geo bonds, and they were approved by the public. So with that, I'll turn it over to Scott. He'll tell you where we're going to go, what we're going to do, and um, next steps, and we and some introductions too. Yeah, if I can first inter introduce uh, Aaron Okel from Tellurus Architect. He's the one that's been working with us on this project. Um, he did obviously the phase one and phase two reports. Um, I, I think at this time it's, and Aaron, unless you have anything you'd like to say, introductory comments? Uh, no, not at this point. Okay. Um, I, I think it's probably best if we do the tour, um, and, and that tour is where we'll see all the issues, uh, at least the majority of the issues that were identified in the phase one assessment report. Officially, or how does that work? Right we, we do have IT in the room that is going to be able to film that, so we'll still be broadcasting. Okay. Sure. Yeah. All right. Some of the main issues that we see here that we deal with in the police department as well is the direct and immediate access to the manager's office here. Um, this is very similar to what we'll see down by the chief's office, my office, and so I'll try to cover it all at once here. But um, basically what we have is there's doors on four sides of the building. It's open all the time. Uh, anybody can come from the outside up these stairs and be in this door without anybody even knowing about it. Um, we struggle, I think, between the aspect of being open while being safe at the same time. Um, we certainly want to make sure we have that public interaction and the accessibility to the public, but we also have to worry about safety and security concerns. So one of the problems we have is just, that, again, like that immediate access right in. I can tell you on Friday, for just an example, I was on the phone in my office. A person walked in and came in the side door and was seated at my desk in front of me while I was still on the phone. So I had no idea who the person was, and they went to the phone and addressed the person in the room. So that happens commonly. That, that, that happens enough that it's, it's an issue. Right? It's a matter of do we lock and secure the door, or how do we stay open for staff to be able to come in and talk to us when they need to, or also be invited to the public at the same time. So um, that's a security concern that we see throughout this suite here, as well as the, the police uh, suite downstairs. And you'd like to add up your time? Yeah, I would just say that once we go into any modern city hall, there's control access before you can actually get in, back into the office areas. It's usually a, a very large kind of public space. Then there's a control desk, like we would have in the clerk's office. And I think that's that's what's anticipated in here as well. So if you go Google Township, 48 District Court, um, even Beverly Hills, okay, they have a controlled open area that you go into. It's not uncommon, more modern. You know, the reality is 30 years ago, we weren't facing the situation that we're facing now with access to public buildings, schools, churches, city walls. Um, there were incidents, okay, back in that day, um, especially uh, commission meetings where you would have persons approached um, with that direct access as well. I don't know how you avoid that, except to provide some built-in security. But, you know, most of these city halls you would go into, there's cameras on the entrance. <laughs> Somebody's monitoring the cameras, more than one person is monitoring. We don't have cameras. In this is about as open a soup of a building as you want to find. And 
just the way it's designed. I've had people in my office demanding to see the city manager walk right in, walk right into meetings when I've got people in the meetings. And I've got to take my time to explain to them that I'm in a meeting. And I'm really good at de-escalation. Um, but that isn't the kind of environment that's really appropriate in this day and age, in my opinion, and something that needs to be I just want to pop our heads in the, to the finance department so we can take a look and understand the space like some of the coordinators. Scott, before you get into my interview, yes. one other thing I want to say is we have we do have impacts the number of, of our buildings and spaces to which you have to go We opened up the city hall to so now that that checkpoint is the Staff, I think staff can be better about sense of being more secure. It wasn't so much you want to really stop and think it's not a good one to protect the meetings and things like that. Just not as important as it is that we have it. I made that call. So in speaking with the finance department, just a, a couple issues they asked me to bring up was, um, first and foremost, the assistant finance director, uh, we put up a temporary period in some other office. Um, clearly it's, it's open on top to have the type of private conversation that's just it's not happening in there. Um, the finance director is actually across the hall in a separate office. Um, he does have the, the benefit of privacy, however, he's not directly into the staff, so he's going to the secure doors um, to work with one another. Um, the other issue they brought up was just the issue of space. Um, in order to have a spot for like the, the, the lunch or coffee, it's kind of in the middle of the hallway here, um, which probably is an ADA issue and uh, other issues like the final canvas here kind of stick out further than the door frame does. And it probably wouldn't make, meet today's code requirements. Although well, they are very festive in their decorations. <laughs> So the main reason I wanted to bring you back in here is just to see this space, how big this space is. This used to be all just IT server rooms, as with technology, servers are completely downsized. Um, this is a space that we could really utilize, I think, uh, much better than we are now. We're looking at space possibly in the basement to move the server room down. The IT office is in the basement of the building, so anytime they got to come up here and work on anything, it's up and down two flights of stairs. Um, 
and talking to our IT department, that can go from 10 times in a day, depending on uh, whatever they're working on, or maybe just a couple times in a week. Um, so if you ideal, if uh, workflow, those type of issues, if the server room is close to the IT office, additionally, this is a large space that doesn't need the space for the servers like it did 15, 20 years ago. These printers and copiers back here are also used by a lot of the city staff. So they have to come into this area to use these. The city manager's office uses this as well. This is where their main copier is. Um, so people are coming in here because the space is limited where they're at. They have to use a shared space, come in from different areas of the building to access these printers uh, for their work. So um, again, I just wanted to show you the space that this is really a lot of space up here that can be utilized in the future uh, much better than it is today. So again, just to talk about the space, I'm sure you're probably most familiar with this space. This is considered the computer, communications director, the computer, their assistant city manager, and the desk there. You can talk about this to the office there. Well, if you remember back in the day, this used to be the HR student. Um, they used to have your HR assistant out here. They took over what was at that time the IT office down the first floor. IT then moved down to Fraser, which used to be a conference room that is now the IT. So, two things you're probably going to notice a lot from the lack of storage in the back of the space. One of the spaces, which was downstairs, is now the IT office. So, this is the assistant in the office there. Um, these are the doors we're talking about. Uh, access issue, security issue, um, as well as on the other side, you've got to the last door. Other exit for anybody up here. So, when we've gone through security stuff before, I think we've done um, some of that training with the city commissioner in the past, talking about active shooters, different types of things that we unfortunately need to think about today. If you're in this suite, there's no way, unless you're jumping out the window. Um, certainly, we've talked about how to do that in an active shooter situation, sometimes that's better, but there is no other exit out of this suite other than these doors right here. Um, so, that's a big security concern. And you can, as you mentioned earlier, it's easy to just get in this without anybody knowing. Sure. Um, and, and another thing I'll, I'll mention while we're here, and again, this is the exact same situation that we have in the police department. There's a lot of sensitive conversations that go on in here. Um, I can tell you from the police department, sometimes it's personnel issues, sometimes it's crime that we're talking about in the city, sometimes that's sensitive type crimes that we're talking about. Right outside our door it could be anybody from the public walking around and hearing those conversations. So. Uh, when it happens, we have to be careful about what we're talking about and when to make sure that we need to close that door, who's sitting right outside our door. That certainly is the exact same situation that we deal with here with the door and the public right inside. There's really no separation between those conversations and some of maybe should be here in the conversation. Okay. Thank you. Because of the size of the space, kind of set up a, a little thing in the middle there to kind of give them their own areas um, so they can work. Again, storage is an issue. You can see boxes in the corner.
That's that's the interesting point that you bring up because one, you have no controlled access, but you have all this waste space. Whereas if you were to say divvy it up, then you gain all this space and you control the access and you still have to put so as we keep moving towards the east here, these are our only two meeting rooms for all of City Hall. So these rooms are shared by everybody, including the police department. There is no other meeting space in City Hall other than possibly using the commission room. Uh, so it's sometimes it's tricky trying to schedule these rooms if you're setting up, say, for instance, for us, police interviews or employee interviews or uh, meeting room. This, again, this is the only two for the entire City Hall. And the there, there is a wall divider that goes up. It is certainly not soundproof, I can tell you that. The other thing, Scott, I would add is that in the mornings and later in the day, some of the code enforcement and the inspectors use those as offices. So then someone comes in to have a meeting and they're using those as offices because there's no work for us. As, as we go in the building department, as you're going to see, is a lack of space for like reviewing plans. Obviously, you need a big table to put up plans. You're going to see a lack of space there. So, exactly what Janice says, a lot of times what happens is utilize these tables and these meeting rooms for that space to do that which then obviously causes issues if someone else is trying to get into one of the meeting rooms. So. Mm -hmm. that was that was documented in the report is this this room here not being adequate enough for the queuing or patrons who are trying to receive permits. I'd like to uh, introduce Heather Tallier. She's going to uh, give you some information about our uh, community development suite here. This is your planning department, building department, and your code enforcement. Code enforcement, well, should be. And I'm sorry, engineering. Separate room, but they, you know, you can't them. And engineering, yeah. so they're all, they all share this space. Um, code enforcement actually is part of the department because we don't have enough space. They occupy the room next door, so they have their own, own little room. Um, Kind of the same with engineering. We don't have space for all of their offices here, so part of their office is also across the hall. Um, we're kind of spread out. Um, we have the inspector room back there. They also are well, they're supposed to be camera from there, but generally we have to go across the whole conference room, these big table. Um, we have a planning office there. There's a Right out. Not a lot of efficiency of movement. Not a lot of space to actually do what we need to do now. Um, as you can kind of see, it's a little chaotic. We make do with what we can. And then the inspectors are in that back room. There's four of them sitting there. Another thing I just want to point out, because I said you're here a lot of times, is storage. Storage space, if you just happen to look around, and there's a lot of boxes sitting out, paper sitting out in this back room where the inspectors are. You'll see much of the same thing if you would take a look back there, kind of poke your head in the office. Um, storage space, it, it's a big issue that we have. Um, each department doesn't have its own dedicated storage. It's kind of a shared storage. Or you basically use the space you have to try to create the space for storage. Uh, I also want to point out the glass up here at the counter. This was a temporary... COVID measure that was put in place that is not a safety glass, that is just a, a, a low level plexiglass. Um, probably a strong cushion could probably come over. It is not the type of glass we would want for a safety measure or an actual physical divider. Again, it was put up because of COVID, 
it's going to stay. It is a great separation, so it is going to stay for the future. Um, but I just want to be sure that we're aware that that's just a, a plexiglass temporary place there. It's really not like a safety barrier. It's a to look at what what Chip Curry is saying that the visibility to the department from from the counter is is quite wide. You can see pretty much the entire department from there, and it's it it, it makes a security issue for people back here, and and also an operational issue where people are trying to do their work and then get called to the counter. The reason that this was set up for years and years and years ago was because planning, engineering, and building all had something to do with the building permit review process, right? And so we wanted everybody back here. One of the biggest challenges you have in city government is people siloing up in terms of their department. The whole issue back here was to get everybody to be collaborating with each other on, you know, reviews to make sure, and all developing a relationship with each other. The crew we have back here now in the, in the department heads and uh, just the, the, all of the other employees, they get along really well together. And you can imagine what it's like when one or two don't in this environment. And we've had that experience. Right now, we are in a very good time period in terms of collaboration, everybody getting along. But it's very close quarters to be having people that don't get along very well. But the people back here right now are actually a really solid team. The whole point, though, is that they're all together sharing information. They're learning from each other. They're cross-training each other as to the different functions that each of the departments had. The other advantage we have is that our new public works director was the assistant city engineer. So he now has a direct connection with our city engineer so that they are still communicating back and forth even though we have a remote public works operation. That's the, that is a much more significant connectivity to you know, understanding what the engineering and DPS roles are. And they play off each other a lot more than was occurring previously. Some things were being done without any engineering review from public works, which is not a good approach to how we should work. Files need to be kept, you know, as built drawings need to be established for things that we approve. So that was the original concept of why this used to call the bullpen. I don't think you're supposed to say that anymore, but this was the bullpen, right? So that everybody was collaborating. Uh, well, we were just going to mention, you may see the circle staircase over here. I just wonder what that leads to. But sure, so this this is your attic. This leads up into the attic space. It's a, it's a, it's a rather large, vast space up, up there. And it's the it's the home of the air. air um, there's a very large air handling unit that is that has been in use for quite a while now. Our mechanical consultant has stated that it's reached the use reached the end of its useful life. It uses excess energy than what it needs, and it should be the um, yeah. And, uh, and just just to I guess add to that, and if you've read through the phase one assessment report you'll see that there's actually quite a few different mechanical items in there that were identified at the end of life, um, including the large generator that's outside to power the building and feed some power loss. So there is definitely a significant cost coming up in the future to replace some of that. Um, and those replacements were built into the estimate uh, for uh, renovation and expansion. So so, for a, a historical question: What was the original purpose of this room in the fireplace in the building? Anybody know? Tom, what was the original, the original purpose of the fireplace? Yeah, this was the uh, this was the volu this was the volu this was the fire department. Okay. So this was that the lovely kind of backdrop was a part of their kind of their yeah. room. Of. And yep. if you go up here, which sounds like we're not, but I have to tell you, there's a lot of old outdated equipment up there, even just left there and the new one, the newer ones put in. And 
there's a tower that goes up, which you may or may not have noticed, that the fire department used to hang their hoses to dry. So you can actually go up here, then you go down there, go down there, climb up a ladder on the wall, then go up a bunch of little tiny stairs and get to the very top. To the so that's what they used to, that's how you dried hoses in the old days, it's just an air drying. Now they put them in a, in a big rack, a gas fire rack, and you dry them that direction. This was kind of the quarters where the firefighters actually stayed, and then the garages, of course, have to host the, the vehicles and so forth. So this, this was almost everything. <coughs> that's, how, that's how it was built with all of the quarters and everything. And it was designed for a completely different area. One other thing about the attic, um, the, there's a fire sprinkler system throughout the building. And in the attic, you can see the fire sprinkler system. The, sp the fire sprinkler heads are over 50 years old. And by the code, they need to be replaced. Our, our fire protection consultant has evaluated that and made a determination that the, the entire sprinkler system throughout the building is likely to be replaced. Aaron mentioned something, what you said to me earlier about the space for um, people coming in talking talk to us. Yeah, the staff. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Space for Right. One of the other issues we identified about that counter over there is uh, is that there's a there's a problem with human space. So when when there's a lot of people coming in to 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 do their plan check reviews or receive their permits, they have a tendency to, to pile up in this room. Um, as we were as was mentioned to us um, in this day and age with with personal space uh, being important, that is a concern. And so people have been queuing up down the hall. Which is creating a security issue in the hallway. Work for how we conduct business anymore. And then the plexiglass, we are no longer have the ability to even roll out plans with a builder that comes in. We have to go to the table across the hall or one of the conference rooms. Right, she, she had mentioned the storage in, in this particular department. There's special needs for the type of storage here due to the roll drawings and folded <laughs> drawings, and they, they don't have enough. Samples. Something comes in and they bring samples for lights, they bring samples for the cladding material on the buildings, all of that stuff comes in here. The lettering on the signs, they have to bring in all of those types of examples for exhibits in the public areas. Um, one of the things you might want to note on the way out of that fire station or on the uh, fireplace, the fire person's fireplace, because their fire axes crossed over the top of the big fireplace.
So while we're at this end of the building, uh, one of the things I wanted to address and talk about is ADA access. Um, how could someone, for instance, let's say a wheelchair, get into the building? The uh, wheelchair access that we have is right here in the back of the building. There are two ADA parking spaces right outside the door here into the municipal parking lot. Um, the issue with this is, as we all know, there's one door that's open to the city hall at night. If someone's coming to this meeting, coming to the commission meeting tonight in a wheelchair, and access to access to the building is the door over there at the police lobby. When they get to that door, they're going to hit the button, talk to the police department, and say, I need access. They're going to have to go back outside. Go around the building, go to this door, and then permit this door up this left, this floor, over to the elevator, up the elevator, then to the station. Obviously, not the greatest access. Uh, additionally, there's there's one sign outside of the station that points at the ADA parking back here. So it's really not a good way for anybody who's coming to the meeting to know that they even have to park back here because of access. There is a buzzer outside if someone is there that the bus and get police dispatch to get that in. They have to know to get there first. And all the signs around the buildings obviously point people to the one open door uh, for the building. So that's a big concern with ADA offices. So this is the shopping district offices. Uh, I want to go over here real quick first. This is oh, sir? that elevator obviously is it's a lift, it's not an elevator, and it's very temperamental. When we've had people get stuck or after an hour something have to call. And then, of course, they have to travel to one thing down to the side. It's not the best. Have we have had complaints about what you described? It would drive me nuts, but yes. have we had complaints? Yes, I personally wrote an a, 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 I'm sorry letter to somebody probably about 12, 14 years ago, and that's when we put the buzzer out there because it wasn't even a buzzer. So they would wait there and nobody would let them in. Yeah. There's a camera, yes. Yeah. So there's a camera that oversees the parking lot that does pick up that door. So when it hits something, it's that buzzer, it brings in the right dispatch, they can pull that camera off and take a look at this door. Yes. Uh, so over here is the ESD director's office. And then across the hall, over here is the So again, the main issue here is storage. Um, right now, things are fairly quiet for the BSD. Um, there are certain times of year, the place on different events going on, where it's hard to walk through here because, again, they do not have their own storage room. There's no storage space outside of what you see here um, for them. The garage out here is used quite frequently by all the departments for storage. Um, there's different times of year where we go out there in the garage and we can hardly get to our police bikes or motorcycles because it's just blocked in with everybody else's stuff. Um, because there is no storage room for it. Um, like I said, often in here you will see piles and piles of stuff that we have different events going on because they, they just don't have anywhere else to put it. Um, again, the same type of uh, plexiglass you see was put up here, very cold, it would have some type of barrier. And that is not a safety glass, that's just a, basically the same type of stuff in here. There's no parts of it. Oh, 
So we're in the Treasury Department. Um, city Treasurer sits in the office over there. The rest of the staff is through here. Again, a lot of the same issues you're going to see here is storage. You can see file cabinet upon file cabinet upon file cabinet upon file cabinet of uh, storing stuff away here. So behind this wall here is where the vault is. Um, if you want to take a walk through, this will be seen on the path. Again, you'll see the same type of plexiglass barrier as well. But in this suite, as well as DSD, there is no other exit. This is the one door to get out of this entire suite. So, again, it's a safety concern. If anything will ever happen in here, if this entrance got blocked, your only alternative is to, to break the glass and open windows and fire jump out to the There's no other exit out of the space. Um, how much of what was saved was uh, designed by professional commercial? office space plans, and how much of it was, you know, sort of on the fly, targeted, saying, let's do this, let's do that. You understand what? what yeah, I'm originally, saying? you know, when we did the redesign in 93, it was laid out, they really had models of everything, and it, it fit that, but, you know, in 30 years, a lot of this stuff changed. Some of them we actually used professional designers, you know, for these modular units, others, you know, the department made decisions, this will work, this will work, this is what we need. You look at some of these cabinets, some of these cabinets have been there a long time. So it's it, it's not entirely professionally laid out anymore. That's just a result of time and adaptation. Another issue with this department is the, is the sight line from the counter going all the way back to the treasurer's office. There is no obstruction between the two. And with the vault uh, leading directly into the vault from the store, there's no staging area to perform any sort of operation such as counting currency or any, you know, storage or any sort of vestibule where, where something can be done before going into the vault itself. So the vault is exposed. Where is the vault? Thank you. It's one of two. Do we have all those cards? Be surprised with tickets. So while we're here, I just wanted to address the issue of, again, ADA access. So this is the main entrance to City Hall. Obviously, it's a series of steps. Some of the mobility disabilities probably have been the time to be However, this is probably one of the busier parts of City Hall. It's the Treasury and the Post Office. And because this both face one another, this is a very unusual type space. Um, during a busy day, there's multiple people at the counter. And we you mentioned upstairs, mentioned about we got great hallways and here we got the exact same situation so this space would be much better used if we turn these towers off to the side and we can separate that space the, the other issue is, is, is the ability to hear um, there's a lot of conversations going on between the two because they're so close together it's sometimes difficult for the clerk to hear what the person saying to them because of the conversation going on right behind them that the building matter. so it does create conflict um, it, it is a tight area where there's a lot of people congregating in one small space.
So, so it's in file. So again, this, this is space, and I sound like a broken record, but storage, right? You see this is a very small space. Um, there are the volunteers, hard time to come in, and some volunteers to help work with this space. It becomes very, very tight. But multiple times through that day, you can see how packed that is in there. During election time, there's all ways to take over the booth. So, voting booths are keeping the binders ready to go out with the precincts. During election time, most of the hallway is filled with the weird storage. So uh, again, they have no separate storage room. This is it. This is their space. Um, and I'm really kind of. Um, is this a corner of the That is their fault. Yeah, that's current. This the largest percentage increase in uh, I, I think that, like, to have them take the rest of the wing over here to the outside where my office is going to is to give them extra space. All of the storage room in the basement, the living room and the storage space. This is also the location for our personal office. They have nothing. Right here. <laughs> Just in case you're Upstairs, talking about uh, you know, police offices over here, police admin offices, very similar to what we see up in the city manager office. Uh, much like Tom had already mentioned, I, I pretty much guarantee if you go ahead and just part of the state of Michigan, every country for that matter, you cannot walk in off the public and walk right into the chief's office. It happens routinely, it happens very often. I've actually had people over before that we've had to kick out because of their demeanor and they're just coming in off the street. So um, it's, it's not safe, it's not how it should be. It, the other issue again, exterior door. Um, all four sides have that door that is open to public. Um, so a lot of times we also become kind of like say the tour director. People stop at that door, well I think it's like where do I need to get my taxes? Where's the engineering part? Where's this? Where's that? I mean, that just becomes that door because somebody can open it. So so we're going to go into our report room and dispatch center. Um, I just ask we be quiet as we go in there because we don't know what they're dealing with at the time. If they are busy, we'll just walk right through. If they're not busy, we may stop for a conversation in there. This is an area that we can't record, so we'll go through the slides. Yeah, we're going to have to do that. No, you have that off. No, you have that off. I know this is a tight space, um, but I just wanted to show that this is the area where officers come in and they have to write reports after making arrests, taking a call for service, whatever it is. This is the area they have to work in. This is the area they have to process evidence. This is the area where they're going to write their entire report. Uh, behind you are mailboxes. One of the biggest issues we have as far as custody, chain of custody, evidence is an officer comes in here to make a report. 
this is where their evidence is. Our evidence lockers are in the basement. The only way to get to that basement is out through the public space. So drugs, guns, whatever it may be, we have to go out through that hallway, out through the public space, and down. You know, the way to do it is to go through our dispatch center, through the clearing room, outside, back around inside of the side of the door, and then downstairs to get to our evidence storage. There's just no other access to it. So um, it's an issue. We've had guys carrying rifles through public hallways because we have to go down to evidence lockers after they come in. So we'll come to our dispatch center. dispatch service for them, there was a need for a third council. The desk that is over here used to be just like a supervisor desk coming to sign off reports at the end of the day. We had to convert that into a workspace uh, to have a third dispatcher available. The problem we have here, again, I'll just go back to storage and space. Right? A dispatch center should have an area for our dispatchers to grab some meat, grab a bite, sit off to the side, take a break without having to leave the dispatch center. The problem we have is our dispatcher wants to take a break, they have to go downstairs to the break room. If a 911 emergency call comes in, they're unaware that anything's going on unless they have their police radio with them. So they can hit the fan up here and they have no idea they need to come running back in here to help. Uh, restroom facilities, they have to go out to the public space to use the public bathrooms. Uh, ideally, there should be a dispatch break room restroom attached to this area um, so that they can be in close connection with this dispatch center at all times. Um, in the event that something happens, they can jump in and help out. Unfortunately, right now, they have to leave this area uh, to do that. Again, very tight. One of the issues we deal with here is the layout of the dispatch space. Um, we work very much in the team dispatch atmosphere. If this dispatcher here was to take the emergency call, the problem we have now is that two other dispatchers are talking up across them, trying to say, I'm dispatching fire. I'm getting EMS going. I'm calling. DT or whatever because of power lines, or I'm reaching out for mutual aid help, and they're talking over top, and then this dispatcher is having hard time. Layouts of dispatch centers should be more like a circular, right? So they work in, in conjunction around one another, so there's never this communication going across ones. Um, that way, that team dispatch works a lot better. It makes it much quicker for us to do emergency services out to whoever needs that. Well, we can do that. That's why we do the team dispatch, but this makes it difficult. When, for instance, that middle person takes that emergency call and the other two are trying to assist. Um, the other thing is, you might have heard, obviously, we look at upgrading all our cameras. Most of the stuff we have here is, is at its end of life. A lot of the cameras we have out on the streets right now are, are starting to fail. There's some camera locations that have no camera there now. Um, we're hoping to expand that. And as you can see, we really have no more space to put any more monitors. So it's, we can put up the cameras, we just can't monitor them we would like to. Oh, it's very dark there, yes. But it's strong. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah. Okay. Bell and This is super hard. <laughs> so, come this way, I want to show you the uh, booking room and the jail cell here.
So this is our booking room. I, I, part of our tour was going to go outside. It was raining, so I'm going to push you all into the rain. Uh, but I certainly want to show you that on rain day, this is our access to the booking room. Okay, and the person that is arrested will come off this walkway into the booking room. Snow, ice, rain, is a person is unsecure in a public space. As you've probably seen, there's a lot of public that uses this as a pastor to the shape part of the ocean. And we're dealing with those prisoners right now. Um, Sally Parks is what we should have. Like I said, you see Andrew Sally Parks. We were in the transportation of the prisoners. Once we're in the booking room, you can see that extremely tight space. I can't count on my hands the number of times I've been picked by a prisoner that's on that and be part of that. Okay. There's just no safe spot to get by when you're dealing with a great prisoner. prisoner. I've been kicked personally several times for someone that's been out. Just last week we had a prisoner that I raised he was handcuffed to the bench. He kicked this entire beam off the counter. This is a $20,000 finger membership. He was able to kick it off the bench and with his toes, believe it or not, pulled the car off it. So, but he's more than one. We have more than one prisoner. We will usually temporarily put someone in a holding cell. We will pat them down, make sure we're safe. We'll take them from the holding cell. We will process the prisoner time. And then we'll have them inside. Very tight space, very long, very unsafe for any type of food. We have two cells for each cell. You shoot them. Kind finds this. And those cells are on the general object to bring in their own things. They also have a one of the things I would say is that we have operated on less square footage for officers for capita any place I'd be in any place that I'd be in. This is an extremely small square footprint uh, for a police department of this size to be operating. I'm the same size, buddy. And obviously, all the different levels do it. They get very complex. So, we treated our firefighters in the community no better than we treated our police in terms of facilities. So the other thing I just want to point out here again is obviously the storage issue. As you can see right behind the city, Andrew, Tom Marcus, and the ton of boxes. Um, we're in the process of trying to identify that and see if we can that a little bit, but that's basically due to a lack of storage. Um, when we talk about storage, evidence storage, we do have an evidence room in the basement here. However, it's too small. We have two off site storage rooms that we keep the police reports or have the We have one where we took over the control facilities with our TPS. Turn that into a long term evidence storage. And then we also have evidence storage over at uh, Chester Garage. There's a security right there that was going to watch. The problem with that room is that it's a shared storage room from the entire city hall. So it is locked down by the police department due to our state requirements of active detention. And the only way someone that's not in law enforcement can go over there is if they're escorted by the police. So if the first officer is trying to do that, there's something that's going to be escorted to do that because we have to have that shared space with the law enforcement. Oh, you got to that. Yeah. You know, that's what I did here a year and a half ago. Um, behind you over here is our juvenile. How was that the thing she had? That's the board. Very small room off the bar. I only bring it up because we also use it as our video room. Um, we almost never really hold juveniles, so just keep your don't use for that. Um, it becomes our video arraignment room. And in order to do a video arraignment, we have to take someone from booking out through the common workspace here where our non swan or clarifier. We have to take that person through here into that video arraignment room to be arraigned. Uh, again, I have to for our clerks and secretaries and open that these down. Additionally, when we take a prisoner to our detective field for interviews, there's no room up here, there's no interview room up here. 
They take that person from booking, they bring us through that clerical, they go right through the public counter, public space here, out to the stairwell, that's a common use of the city hall, and then down the stairs to the fire detective room. Uh, that's the only way to get down to where our interview is. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk down there right now. Imagine you're a police officer escorting a prisoner and wherever they be. This is the path you have to go to get through. This guy's going to speed it up. It's at 50. Okay. Yeah, right? Yeah. I don't say delay, but... No, I, when a guy was filming... Oh, he's going to go downstairs now. Don't look at the pictures on the wall. Oh, okay. They're going yeah. in the locker rooms, are they? Oh, I took that down. Alex, okay. is that a body cam? <laughs> oh, no. What? Is that a body cam? I'm sure it's somebody's cell phone. Oh, okay. Oh, they took them off again. Huh? They did. So you just said they go to the locker room. Oh, okay. So just real quick, because I know we're short on time, this is our detective bureau. We have three people that worked out here full time. We have three other detectives that were signed up in special agents. We have our core clinician, Hillary, clinician. Those two guests are kind of the remote desks where those five people have to show this workspace. You want to come on up one right here? The other three have to sign up this. This is our interview room. This is what we bring the person down to. This is really in a secure room. It's very thin glass. It should be a secure safe room. Because that could be a prison room. Who knows what crime that we're trying to hold. It's not a secret. Uh, no, but I also wanted to point out, as you came down the stairs, you saw all the stuff in the stairwell there. We utilize space the best we can for storage. The other thing right behind you, also if you look, there's three lockers there. We had to add additional lockers to these things so as the type of gets assigned you. We got to take them out of the locker room and give them these lockers because we don't have enough lockers in the locker room to have the space to So we have to kick them out and we have to utilize those things. This is where we have an emergency department meeting that's usually the doctors. When we have special events, there's been a jam pack of people that we bring out of the area office, sometimes in the office of different departments, um, as well as our own office. So this is just been from the jam pack. Yeah. 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 This is the work call room. We're here in the sidewalk next to the evidence lockers. So this is where the officers have to bring it. Did you really? No. The reason why they have to bring it is because they Here's the ones that have the library stuff on it where they can tag properties. Oh, that's a good one. Brown Iron Brew House. Oh, yeah. Oh, I bet. It's by the house. Yeah, it's over by our house. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I took 800 Motrin before I left my house. I took 400. I didn't prepare myself. <laughs> oh, my word. word Feels word. nice and cool in here now. several workshops where we Okay, we are back in the commission room. We have just concluded a very interesting and very informative tour of uh, City Hall, noting um, all the hard work 
that gets done here in much less than optimal conditions. We are going to um, call briefly for any public comment for the workshop session. I see so none. Do we have Online. everybody? And I see none in the room. So we will be adjourning the workshop session because we did not complete the uh, opportunity for questions, discussions, and comment, or the, the entire presentation, we will be scheduling another workshop on the City Hall topic at a further date. So the workshop session is concluded, and we will have uh, just a, uh, three or four minutes before we start the 7.30 regular commission meeting. this evening and call to order the regular April 3rd uh, Birmingham City Commission meeting. Um, if you would all join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Woods, would you please call the roll? Mayor Long? Here. Mayor Pro Tem McLean? Here. Commissioner Baller? Here. 
Commissioner Boutros? Here. Commissioner Hag? Here. Commissioner Host? Here. Commissioner Schaefer? Here. Thank you. Uh, we now move to proclamations, congratulatory resolutions, awards, appointments, resignations, and confirmations, administration of oaths, and introduction of guests and announcements. Um, we announce that the city recommends members of the public wear a mask if they have been exposed to COVID-19 or have a respiratory illness. City staff, city commission, board, committee members must wear a mask if they've been exposed to COVID-19 or actively have a respiratory illness. And the city continues to provide uh, masks at the back of the room. We also would like to note and wish a happy birthday to Commissioner Schaefer and ask her if she would like a song. We, we sang last year, and we have lots of other people to celebrate this evening, so, so let's do that. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer. Thank you. Again, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, we now move to appointments. We have uh, an appointment to appoint Joe Robel to the Parks and Recreation Board as an alternate mem member to serve a three-year term to expire March 13th, 2026. Is Mr. Robel with us? He's online. He's online. Uh, Mr. Robel, would you like to just introduce yourself and say a few words about why you're interested in serving on the Parks and Rec Board? Uh, sure. This is Joe Robel at 2665 Windermere. Um, so I found my picture here. Um, I would like to uh, actually have some involvement with the Parks and Recreation Board as an alternate member. Um, I'm very interested in the park's master plan and how it affects all of our park system. Uh, I think people move to Birmingham uh, with their top reasons is our stellar park system. Uh, I'd like to see the uh, Rouge River Trail connected. Um, I'd like to take a look at uh, the possibility of having more paddleball courts and uh, different types of recreation that appeal to people. Uh, it also, uh, just to maintain the, the high quality of our park system, uh, to take a look at some consistency between parks. Uh, and I've been very happy with uh, the entertainment that's offered with our park system as far as uh, the music, um, movies in the park, and different alternate type uh, events that uh, are of interest to families. All right. Uh, I'm an avid golfer. Uh, my son and I uh, really enjoy playing at both the golf courses, Springdale and Lincoln Hills. Um, of course, the ice arena is a tremendous uh, uh, benefit to the city as well. Thank you, Mr. Robel. Do any commission members have any questions for Mr. Robel? Uh, seeing none, do we have a nomination? Be Commissioner happy. Baller. I would be delighted to nom nominate Mr. Robel. To serve as an alternate member to serve a three-year term expiring March 13th, 2026. <laughs> uh, all in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Yes. Any opposed? I see none. So, Mr. Robel, the clerk will reach out to you about uh, swearing you in and having you sign at a later date. And uh, thank you for your interest and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, we now move to recognition of promotions, and uh, we have uh, Chief Gruy. Did you want to note those? Absolutely, if you would mind, uh, Mayor. Um, I want to talk just briefly um, about the people we have in front of you today. As a chief, this is a very proud moment to recognize some of our finest uh, in the police department. Um, our promotional process is a pretty extensive one. Um, first, you have to have four years on the job to be considered for promotion. Um, and then the promotional process re is the combination of a written test. That written test usually covers anywhere up to maybe a thousand pages of uh, text. Um, that can be different leadership management books as well as our policy and procedure manual. Um, their seniority rating and service rating uh, is calculated into their tally as well as a uh, oral interview. For their interview we bring on uh, agents, other agencies come in and sit on the panel. Um, to get an outside uh, look into our candidates and conduct that interview and they give us feedback and they rate them based on that. That total score is how they're tallied in the end um, and how those promotions work. So first, I just want to uh, go through each one and just give you a little bit of information. Uh, Jamie DeBano. Jamie attended Oakland Community College as a student athlete. She attained her associate's degree. She began a career with the city as a part-time laborer for DPS and a Zamboni driver at the ice arena. She later transferred to the police department and as a parking enforcement assistant, and in July of 2016 was hired as a dispatcher. 
She has excelled as a dispatcher and was selected to be one of our communications training officers, tasked with the training of all new hires in our dispatch center. Dispatch DeBono is one of our best in the dispatch center and was promoted to dispatch manager on March 18th. Congratulations, dispatch manager DeBono. Next, we have Mike Manzo. Michael graduated from Michigan State University with a degree in criminal justice and a minor in sociology. He was hired by our department as a police officer in June of 2015. During his career with our department, he's always been that person that you can count on to get involved. Michael is one of our department's firearm instructors and taser instructors, and he also assists our department armor in the scheduling and planning of all training. On March 27th, he was promoted to the position of sergeant. Congratulations, Sergeant Manzo. Uh, Jordan Zale. Jordan Zale graduated from Grand Valley State University with a degree in criminal justice and was hired in our department as a police officer in August of 2014. During his career, Jordan has shown himself to be a professional and courteous and was selected to be one of our field training officers, again tasked with training all new police officers hired by our department. Jordan is currently enrolled in Command Level 1 Leadership Training and on July 13th he was promoted to the position of Sergeant. Congratulations, Sergeant Zale. Alex Linke. Alex graduated from Oakland University with a degree in sociology. He served six years in the United States Marine Corps and was honorably discharged as a sergeant. Alex was hired by our department as a police officer in February 2017 and was previously assigned to our narcotics enforcement team. He was promoted to sergeant in July of 2021 and was assigned to the detect division where he served as a general case detective and a school resource officer. On January 13th, Alex was promoted to the position of lieutenant. Congratulations, Lieutenant Linke. And Ryan Kearney. Ryan graduated from Western Michigan University with a degree in criminal justice and was a member of the university's track team. He was hired by our department as a police officer in 2003, and in 2015 he was promoted to the position of sergeant, and in 2019 he continued to rise through the ranks becoming a lieutenant. He graduated from the Eastern Michigan School of Police Staff and Command in 2021, and in December of 22, Ryan was promoted to the position of operation captain. Congratulations, Captain Kearney. After uh, uh, swearing in by the clerk, I do invite uh, all those in attendance. We do have a small reception uh, downstairs if you would like to come join us for some drinks and snacks to celebrate the promotions. I appreciate it. solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of this state and endeavor to secure and maintain an honest and efficient administration of the affairs of Birmingham, free from partisan distinction or control, and to perform the duties in the Birmingham Police Department according to the best of my ability. Okay, now smile for your family. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, now if you want to turn and get that way, please, and you can get a picture for your. And the entire commission <laughs> congratulates you and thanks you all for your service and for choosing Birmingham. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner, City Manager Marcus, sorry. Before you leave, guys. Oh, No, I'm, I'm not going to make any comments in that regard. I'm okay. going to say, though, that this is with the commission's concurrence is going to become a regular event for all the departments bringing our new employees before you so that you get a chance to meet them and hopefully build a more team kind of esprit de corps kind of organization Excellent. as a part That's of it. That's great. Excellent. Thank That's you. That's great. Yep. So uh, we'll give families. family members a moment to access. 
And uh, while we're doing that, we are um, open to the public for matters not on the agenda this evening. I see no public comment in the room. And I see no public comment online. So we will move to the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion and approved by a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of the items unless a commissioner or citizen so requests, in which event the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered under the last item of new business. Are there any items any commissioners would like removed from the consent agenda? <coughs> commissioner Haig. E. Echo. E. Echo. All right. Uh, any other items? I see none. Do any members of the public wish to move any items from the consent agenda? I see none in the room, and I see none online. So could we get a motion, please? Uh, Commissioner Boutros. I'd like to uh, make a motion to move the consent agenda, excluding item E. Second. Second. All right. Uh, any comment on the motion? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Woods, would you please call the roll? Mayor Long? Yes. Commissioner Hag? Yes. Commissioner Baller? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McLean? Yes. Commissioner Host? Yes. Commissioner Schaefer? Yes. Commissioner Boutros? Yes. All right. Uh, Commissioner Hag, would you like to address item E? Yeah. <clears throat> it's the wording of the um, resolution. And that's, are we sure we want to adopt and approve in its entirety, blah, 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 knowing that the plan as it's written has mistakes in it? Because then we're adopting known documented mistakes that haven't been corrected. Uh, City Manager Marcus. Yeah, I, I think the, the language allows <laughs> the commission to alter the plan to correct things, and I fully expect that that will occur. This is the product that was forwarded to you by the plan board, and it's my opinion that the qualifying, the operative language in the motion is to consider. And as such, um, I fully expect, as a part of the process, a public hearing is conducted. I'd be surprised if you didn't have more than one public hearing conducted on this process mm -hmm. and I expect that changes will be made I mentioned something that probably needs to be changed at the last meeting so I think you know in, in, in terms of my statement which you can um, point out going forward that your consideration just means that you're considering it it doesn't mean you're adopting it Four votes have to be achieved to adopt it at some point going forward. And I concur that there's probably some concerns with uh, issues in it. Uh, we had one resident write to me, and I said we would address those at the public hearing, which is the appropriate place. All right. Is that uh, all your concerns, Mr. Hay? Good enough. Yeah. Motion right. to adopt mo uh, item E as written. Do we have a second? I second that. Uh, so, all right. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. Any comments on the motion? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Well, just thank you for that um, clarification, um, focusing on the word consider, because we spent the end of last meeting talking about some details, which we agree are not clear, but will be made clear. So we'll all commit. I will certainly commit to following up on those details. All right. Any public comment on the motion? Uh, oh. Uh, Commissioner Baller had a commissioner comment on the motion. I did. Uh, well, we're, we're setting it for a date, and I'm I'm just I gotta believe that the administration is taking into account that May 22nd on our meeting of May 22nd that's going to consume a lot of time. And right, as I you know, said, I suspect that you're going to have more than one public hearing, and yeah. it's likely that you will move to. Uh, <clears throat> continue the public hearing process yes it will consume a lot um, there's a lot of issues that are coming forward so I think you should allocate some time but you know this has been under review now for four years and what I my experience in Birmingham has been that 
a lot of times your public doesn't show up necessarily at the public hearings and the subordinate boards. But by the time it gets to the city commission, everybody's interested in it because they know it's close to the precipice of getting approved. So I suspect that you're you're going to be dealing with all sorts of issues that way okay. and changes. All right. Any other question or comment? Mr. Bloom. Thank you, David Bloom. I'm a Birmingham resident. Um, I understand the process. I understand Mr. Marcus's comments. Um, I have heard, and you all have heard numerous times that this has been going on for four years and we've had lots of meetings and we've had lots of opportunity for public engagement and at the final meeting or close to the final meeting you will get more residents to come out and provide their input. My concern is um, in, in finding some issues and contacting Mr. Marcus about them and then there was a subsequent email where I found another 10 homes that seemed to indicate that the neighborhood is not that the, the zoning for the neighborhood is not correctly identified in the current city zoning map um, that you're being asked to finish the work of the planning board this is like to me a teacher or giving an assignment to the students or to the class and the assignment comes back or it's a dissertation and you're reviewing it and you're being put in the position of having to fix things. You're also being put in the position of having to fix things at a public hearing. And at a public hearing, you will consider items. Residents will come up. They will express their viewpoints. You will debate them. I don't know if you're going to let the public express all their input, um, all of their feedback, and then and then start debating them. But the format of that meeting. I don't think permits a good dialogue with the planning board to ask questions, to to get things corrected. There are maps in, in there that appear to be seriously messed up. Um, and so it's not clear exactly what's being considered or what you're going to be adopting. And if you choose to throw this into the public hearing format without adjusting how that hearing takes place, um, I think it's going to be difficult to come to a resolution and you could end up throwing it back to the planning board anyway. So I would suggest you might want to consider trying to identify some of the issues and having the planning board fix you so you have a more coherent document that people under can understand <coughs> coming before you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any comment, City Manager Marcus? You usually don't comment. Okay. Um, so. Uh, we uh, had comment on the motion. Um, we've had a we have had a second. So, uh, Miss Woods, if would you call the vote? Uh, Commissioner Hag. Yes. Commissioner Host. Yes. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem McLean. Yes. Commissioner Boutros. Yes. Commissioner Schaefer. Yes. Mayor Long. Yes. And Commissioner Baylor. Yes. All right. We move to unfinished business, which is a public hearing for the 2023 liquor license for Whole Foods. So I'm going to open the public hearing and have a staff presentation. I think that's a combination of myself working along still with um, Mr. Dupuy and Chief Brewey. Um, this was part of the annual liquor license review process. Um, at the last meeting, it, the Whole Foods was brought to uh, our attention in regards to the uh, recommendation for a renewal of the liquor license or not um, because of a couple of problems. Um, what has kind of uh, become clear is that Whole Foods is no longer going to be using their on-premises liquor license. Instead, they're going to be changing their bistro footprint into an e-commerce um, and therefore we brought it back so that we were clear uh, between what staff was recommending along with what Whole Foods was requesting and um, and what their attorney was requesting so therefore in front of you uh, today is a suggested resolution um, and that would be to accept the termination and relinquishment of the special land use permit held by Whole Foods upon either the onset of construction if there's a violation of the special land use permit that's new and unexpected, 
or a maximum of 90 days from today, whichever event occurs first. <coughs> and I'm happy to answer any other questions. I do believe Ms. Allen is here, the attorney yes. um, for Whole Foods, and um, Mr. Dupuy is as well. All right, let's have the applicant presentation. Madam Mayor, um, good evening. Kelly Allen on behalf of Whole Foods and on Zoom is the general manager, Ed Capella. Um, we agree with the city's recommendation and we're ready to move forward on the basis. Okay, and uh, Mr. Dupuy, did you have anything to add? All right, is there any questions or comments from the public for Ms. Kucherik, Ms. Allen, or Mr. Dupuy? I see none in the room. I see none online. I'm going to close the public hearing. Any questions from the commission? Uh, Commissioner Boutros. I'd like to comment before I make the motion. Uh, well done on the coming back with the word, Madam Attorney here. I'd like to move the resolution uh, to accept the termination and relinquishment re of the special land use permit held by Whole Food upon the onset of construction or a violation of the special land use permit or a maximum of 90 days from today or whichever event of course first. Second. All right, we have a second from Commissioner Hay. Any comments from the commission on the motion? Mayor Pro Tem. Um, do we have a timeline of when that might be happening? Because I was just there and it was still going on. I believe the application, or did you want to answer that? Okay. Sorry, I missed my no problem. Um, the um, plans were submitted to the city, I think, last Friday okay. um, online. I did verify that they are in the works and the departments are they're getting pushed around to the departments okay. to review. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Any comments from the public on the motion? All right, uh, Ms. Witch, would you please call the roll? Uh, Commissioner Hag? Yes. Commissioner Baller? Yes. Mayor Long? Yes. Commissioner Schaefer? Yes. Commissioner Boutros? Yes. Commissioner Host? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McLean? Yes. All right, thank you, and uh, best of luck with the construction. We now move to new business. Uh, our first item is public hearing for a lot combination 34350 Woodward Avenue and 909. 911 Haines Street for Fred Lavery Porsche. Um, and we have a uh, motion to postpone, so I'm going to open the public hearing. Mr. Dupuy. A little deja vu here. I am asking to request postponement again of the public hearing. Further request of the applicant this time um, for one of the applications, a lot combination, just to keep it together with the special land use. And for the special land use permit application specifically, to allow the applicant a little bit more time to go through the contract and work with staff and council to address any concerns that they may have. If, if you'd like me to answer any questions or go into anything further, I'm happy to, but that's the uh, Are there any the questions request. from, uh, I assume there's no applicant presentation, so any questions or comments from the public for this, Mr. Dupuy? I see none in the room, I see none online. Close the public hearing. Any questions from the commission for Mr. Dupuy? Uh, Commissioner Baller. Uh, does this absolutely move it to April 24th? That would be if you were to pass this resolution, yes. Okay. And there's uh, and we have to set a specific date. That, that's what I was just conferring with the with Mr. Marcus. That I, I would suggest that you table mm. uh, the public hearing so that that's not a date certain. Um, we staff are somewhat at the mercy of uh, Mr. Lavery and his his team. So instead of setting it for public hearing and going through all those notices over and over again, instead right. of a date certain, I would make the motion to table. Thank you. That was part of the point, the other part of the point. Well, at the mercy. I, I absolutely <laughs> agree with accommodating the applicant. On the other hand, we seem to, that's going to take up a lot of time at a meeting, right? Three hearings. Um, so it should be a meeting that we decide is appropriate, not the applicant decides is appropriate. So that's my comment. All right. So uh, then, um, Ms. Kucherik, um, uh, so we would change the recommended motion to a motion to table? Yes. Just change the word postpone to table, and everything else would be the same. Without, without mentioning a date, Madam Mayor. Correct. Madam Attorney, sorry. All right. So do we, uh, first of all, have any other questions uh, by the commission? 
Uh, Mayor Pro Tem McLean. Uh, when this eventually comes back to us, will there be um, a discussion of how the roads surrounding that piece of property will be handled? The one that was originally closed and some other ones that may be affected? Absolutely, that'll probably be the focal point. A to detailed be with discussion you. with yes. all the facts. Fantastic. Can I make the motion? You may. I'd like to make the motion to postpone the public hearing. Oh, sorry, to uh, table um, the public hearing in consideration of the lot combination of 34350 Woodward Avenue and 909 911 Haines Street, Fred Levery Porsche, parcel number 19 36 281 022 and parcel 19-36-281-030 to a state that and go to per to, the request. Per the request. Sorry, yep, per the request of the applicant in order to have the SLUP hearing and a lot combination on the same date. Do we have a second? I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Schaefer. Any commissioner comment on the motion? Mayor. Uh, commissioner Boutros. Yes, I, I just want to clarify, is the first time it came in front of us, uh, Mr. Dupuy, uh, I'll address you, Madam Mayor, is we had postponed this knowing that they want to do the slop and the combination of the lot together. Yes. What has changed today? Uh, Anything? I, they so still want to do both yet. things together, and they're still not ready to talk about the slop, so we're going to also postpone the slop. So it's kind of similar to exactly what we faced the first yes. time. Which is why um, they recommended postponing rather than picking another date certain. Yeah, the language of the slup is somewhat Changed. being discussed. Yes. We go. And we are taking a pretty consistent position on what that language should be as to who pays for improvements. And so there is some discussion regarding that. And that's why this is being continued. I think it's the right thing to do to table without a date certain so that we can bring this back if we're going to bring it back with a dispute or if we're going to bring it back with um, concurrence from the city representatives and the developers representatives. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other commissioner uh, comment? Any public comment? None in the room, none online. Ms. Woods, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Schaefer? Yes. Commissioner Hag? Yes. Commissioner Baller? Yes. Mayor Long? Yes. Commissioner Boutros? Yes. Commissioner Host? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McLean? Yes. All right. Now we have uh, new business B, public hearing for uh, the same properties, 34350 Woodward and 909-911 Haines Street uh, for a special land use permit and we also have a motion to postpone so I'm opening the public hearing. Mr. Dupuy, anything else? <laughs> I don't know why I keep sitting down but uh, it, it's the same. Uh, I don't have anything additional to add. Okay. Uh, any questions from the public for Mr. Dupuy? See none in the room. I see none online. I'm going to close the public hearing. Any questions for Mr. Dupuy from the Commission? Commissioner Hay. Thank you. The city manager basically answered the question already that I had about why there's such a, a second delay on the slab. Um, <coughs> but you brought up another question inside my head when you talked about consistency. Are we having anything that is being requested that is exceptionally different to other slops that we should be a little bit concerned about here? or? What's going on? Because a second delay without a date raises eyebrows. Oh, I, 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 I don't know that the eyebrows are being raised on our side of the table. They, you know, they, they saw this slop. I think their legal counsel raised some questions about it, but I'm not going to tell you rest assured, but I would tell you that the city staff is pretty uh, um, consistent on the hmm. language and the assignment of responsibilities in terms of cost um, as we have been in the past so that'll all be explained when that comes back if it comes back in a you know timely fashion so. and commissioner Hague, if i may that's specifically related related to the elm street reconfiguration that's the uniqueness here which is what pro tem mclean was asking about exactly. specifically as well so when we deal with a development development that 
creates an impact on the right-of-way or the improvements in the right-of-way, the expectation is that the development will pay for um, those changes and the improvements that are necessary. <coughs> That's Fair a enough. pretty common theme, but apparently someone on the development team wants to spend more time looking at that. Uh, can I make a motion? You wait. Fine. I'd like to move that the motion to postpone table. to table. Oh, jeez. I wrote table in large letters. The motion to, <laughs> I'm so distracted by Elm Street, the motion to table um, the public hearing and consideration of the special land use permit final site plan and design review application for 34 350 Woodward Avenue Fred Levery Porsche to April no. uh, to oh. a date per the request, per the request. Per the request of the applicant to allow more time to review conditions of the slub contract? Yep. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Host. Any comments on the motion from the commission? Any comments on the motion from the public? I see none in the room, none online. Ms. Woods, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Haig? Yes. Commissioner Boutros? Yes. Mayor Long? Yes. Commissioner Schaefer? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McLean? Yes. Commissioner Host? Yes. Commissioner Baller. Yes. Thank you. You may now sit down <laughs> or, or vacate the room. Yes. Um, we now move to um, resolution to approve a special event permit as requested by the MIU Men's Health Foundation to hold the Cogs and Kegs bicycle ride on June 12, 2023. And uh, that is being presented by Ms. Woods. Yes. Um, so we are requesting um, the special event permit um, for COGS and KEGS, and we do have a representative here who, if she would like to speak a little bit about the event um, that will be on June 12th. Thank you. Hello, uh, Andrea Hamilton, Executive Director of MIU Men's Health Foundation. Uh, Cogs and Kegs is an annual event. Uh, it is a bike ride. We have a 30-mile option as well as a 10-mile option. Um, it begins and ends at Griffin Claw Brewery. Um, is when the 30 mile leaves, it heads north on Eaton, uh, does the little jog on Maple, and then is pretty quickly out of Birmingham. Uh, the 10 mile does go across um, the city a little more, uh, I believe it's Lincoln, and circles around back. Uh, we do have support of Michigan State Police as well as Birmingham Police, Auburn Hills, um, Bloomfield Township, and uh, Troy as well. All right, do any commissioners have any questions for Ms. Hamilton? Mr. Marcus, City Manager Marcus. This is the third time that you're running this event? We've had this event since 2016. Okay, so you may ask, well, why is this on new business? Mm -hmm. Prior to this time, it's my understanding we did not issue a special, or is Scott, a special event permit, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so they're, issue, they're going through the special event permit process now, and when you have technically a new event, that's the case. Apparently, even under the special event, there is no actual closures um, of streets or anything of the sort, so that this should not be a big problem in the community. I would guess that it's run the same way as you've run it in the past. Correct. We have not, as a police department, had to uh, expend a lot of time and effort uh, because they have a very strong relationship with the Michigan State Police, their business. I don't know how that occurred. Uh, but they bring in a lot of assistance from law enforcement, from other agencies as well, although we'll have a presence as well. All right. Thank you for that background. Uh, Commissioner Baller. So I've never, this hasn't missed my radar up till now. That's a good thing. That, that means we haven't caused a problem. Well, yeah, no. No, I mean, it's maybe something I'd want to participate in. But I would we hope that. that the city would help uh, get the word out about this on social media. And what, I mean, so they close, what do they do? Close the parking lot at Griffin Claw? So on Mondays, Griffin Claw is actually not open. Okay. Uh, so they actually open for us specifically. And we do gather in the parking lot. Um, we gather afterwards inside uh, the building as well. 
question? Uh, yes, yes. Commissioner We're Boutros. discussing it now. We have the opportunity to ask you questions. Um, how successful has it been, and is there any issues that has arisen at the past four times or since 2016? Uh, no issues uh, have arisen. Or if, in if you have to change anything, sorry. What yeah. would you change from a city help or from anything else? Uh, nothing Nothing has to change uh, as far as any, any issues that have arisen. Uh, we've seen the event get uh, bigger and bigger every year. With last year, we had about 250 uh, bike riders participating. So it, it just continues to gain popularity. And as of right now, we don't see any issues and anything needing to change. We will have a group. Uh, we have some bicycle clubs that partner with us. They will go check our routes for safety prior to the event and make sure if there's any um, pavement that would be unsafe for riders that we were aware of that and we may end up changing a course um, due to a safety reason. Thank you. Good luck. Mayor Pro Tem. And for those who don't know, this is a men's health awareness issue. Yes, we right. are a men's health nonprofit. Um, this uh, ride in particular, we do like to honor our first responders. And this is more of a general uh, men's health initiative, uh, just to raise awareness of the importance of men uh, not being so stubborn and actually going and getting your screenings. I'm looking at everybody in front of me. There's about five of you I'm staring at. Um, and we do have a prostate cancer focus with some of our other events, but there is a bigger importance in all of uh, health related issues and we're trying to raise that awareness. Thank you. All right, would someone care to make uh, the motion? I'd like to make the motion, Madam Mayor, to uh, approve the special event permit uh, as written uh, by the resolution IWC. All right, do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Baller. Any questions from on the motion from the commission? <clears throat> Any questions on the motion from the public? I just have a question. Was that the mailer that uh, I received? It, the it was. Thank you for opening it. Yeah, no, I, that was good that I got some kind of indication so I could be aware if there's a 250 bikers coming. It shouldn't um, take long to get okay. past your house. And, sir, could you please give us for the minutes your name and address? It's Ron Elman, okay. 1152 Worthington. Thank you. And just as a reminder, generally, if you want to make a comment, you need to come to the podium. So thank you. All right. So uh, with that, all in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Thank you. All right. We now move to resolution for the city to join together with other local governments and public agencies to influence regulatory processes and utility practices through the participation in the Michigan <clears throat> Municipal Association for Utility Issues. And that is uh, Ms. Ecker. Or Yes. Well, I'm sure you've all heard from many residents about some of the ongoing issues we've had with regards to the reliability of the power system and the many outages that we've had. Obviously, hundreds of thousands of people across Metro Detroit and the state were out of power for an extended period of time on multiple occasions. Of course, many, many, many of our residents were in the same situation. Um, so we bring this to you because obviously the city does not have any control over DTE. We don't, uh, we don't oversee their regulation. We don't get to, to get, we can't force them to turn power back on. We can't uh, even give them fines or violations. Uh, we don't control their rates. But that being said, of course, when the power goes out for an extended period of time or multiple times in a short time frame, people start to call, residents start to call our offices. What are you doing about DTE? You know, when we talk to them, we say, Hi, why don't you call DTE? And they say they can't even get through. Um, they get unreliable estimations as to when their power will be turned back on, if they even have an estimate as to when their power will be turned back on, and they can't get anybody on the phone at DTE. So obviously it's been an ongoing problem. Um, we just want to mention, of course, the fact that not only are our residents inconvenienced, and, and I don't even say inconvenience is kind of a light word, um, <clears throat> but we've had many hundreds of people that were displaced from their homes that had spoiled food, that had medication that needed to be refrigerated um, that they lost as a result of this. Obviously, we have people that were displaced, had to go elsewhere, had expenses, trying to stay with somebody, trying to find places for their pets to go. Um, on the city side, of course, the city staff in our public responders are required to go out when there's a situation where there's a storm, for instance, and there are multiple power lines down. We have to send out our public safety officials. They have to go and they have to guard the lines that are down because they're live, they're live wires, so they've stopped the power to all the houses, but the, the wire itself is still live. So they have to go out and they have to sit and, and babysit the wire, so to speak, to keep everybody safe so they don't 
uh, get electrocuted. Obviously, they also have to address any fires or damage that occurs as a result of a line falling and setting something on fire. Uh, also, the issues of trees that are coming down. If there is a, a dangerous situation where a tree is precariously perched above a wire and about to fall, we have to watch out for that. Of course, our public responders also have to deal with increased health and welfare checks, going out to visit older folks or folks that live on their own to make sure that they're okay, people calling, <clears throat> asking us to check on loved ones. And then, of course, as you know, most recently, we also set up an overnight warming center because we had so many people displaced for so many nights in a row, in particular, that it made it hard for them. Uh, so we did have the cost and expense of doing that as well, all while we have no control over DTE. But we understand that many of our residents are extremely frustrated uh, with the reliability of the service that's provided. And I, I say DTE, and I shouldn't. It's DTE and consumers both provide electrical power services. Um, <clears throat> as I think you know from a previous email that went out, uh, the we don't well we don't control them. Our options are to work with state uh, and other officials and elected officials to work on managing DTE, getting some different regulations in place, working with the Michigan Public Services Commission, which is a three-member board that's established and <clears throat> appointed by the governor. Um, for any of you that have seen those meetings, they had three public town halls most recently because they had been getting so many calls about concerns and frustrated residents due to all of the power outages. Um, the Michigan Public Services Commission is charged with the regula regulatory authority over the electrical providers, so they consider rate cases, for instance, if DTE or consumers want to raise the rates, if there is frustration or supply issues or... Um, outages, all of those things they will consider. Um, I will tell you that I attended one of the meetings on March 21st of the Michigan Public Services Committee uh, Commission, and at the very start, they started off by saying, I know we have 100 people out here that want to tell us about all their frustrations. We want to assure you that we have started the process of having a little more oversight over the utility companies. Um, in, in particular, the three things that they touched on at the beginning of that meeting was one, that they have started requiring DTE and consumers to start reporting their outages by census district. You have a lot of areas, and I know our residents have been in that boat, that the same area repeatedly gets loses power, and it's for a lengthy period of time, multiple times in a given month, whether it's a storm, whether it's something else all kinds of different options. So they said that uh, they're now re requiring them to report outages by census tract. That has never been done before. So whether DTE or consumers has done that on their own, they haven't shared it with us, obviously, um, where there's these areas and pockets around town where we do see frequent outages or repetitive outages. Um, also, the Michigan Public Services Commission is conducting an independent audit of DTE and consumers of their utility systems, so they're bringing somebody else in to come in. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard in the past, you know, on any particular issue that comes up with regards to DTE or consumers and the reliability of power while we're working on it or we're taking the rate increase from this year and we're putting it back into the infrastructure of the system so we'll improve reliability in the future but there's been no independent audit of whether or not that is in fact happening well they might be putting money and investing it somewhere is that investment actually increasing the reliability is it improving the system and the infrastructure that's there is it improving the technology that's available or any of those things. There's been no oversight in that regard. Also, the Michigan Public Services Commission also mentioned that they had mandated an increase in the payment. I don't know if many of you heard maybe that there was, if you had your power out for, I think it was three or four days, you'd get $35, $25, which of course doesn't even begin to cover the fact if you have to go to a hotel or if you have to have your pets boarded somewhere else, the food that you lose, any medication that's spoiled, and so on, not to mention your inconvenience. So they have increased that payment um, that they're mandating that DTE provide a payment of $35 a day. Um, now I can tell you as somebody who's lost multiple fridges and freezers worth of food in the last couple of years, even that doesn't even begin to cover it, but in any event, it's, a, it's an improvement, I guess. Um, so at the meeting, I did, spoke, uh, did speak to the Public Services Commission on behalf of the residents of Birmingham 
and the frustrations that we hear as public servants when the residents call us and are concerned about all of these issues. Of course, it was something they heard from many, many people that night. There were all kinds of people from all across the state. I will say Metro Detroit and Ann Arbor seemed to make up the vast majority of people um, that were calling in. And I addressed all of these concerns that I just basically touched on. If you see in your packet, there's a letter that was also submitted, uh, the public comment on reliability of electric services dated March 21st, and that was submitted electronically through their electronic docket to, to put into the record, outlining all of the concerns we have and some of the ideas that we would like to see them focus on to improve it, to invest in a better system, to potentially put some of the lines underground to where it's more reliability, you don't have the trees coming down, uh, taking down the wires, causing property damage, human human life, et cetera, damage, et cetera. So it does appear to us also that there is additional oversight needed for DTE. So um, one of the things we can do is continue to be engaged with our state officials and make sure that we are all focusing on this issue and, and pushing DTE while the city can't individually control that. We can, through the Michigan Public Services Commission, con continue to have a voice. We can work with our state officials. And we found this other company, or well, it's actually not a company, it's a nonprofit, the Michigan Municipal Association for Utility Issues, short form My Maui, which sounds really good, um, <laughs> but basically it's a collaboration, it's a nonprofit that was established, it's a collaboration of many different municipalities in Michigan that work together to address some of these issues, because you know the issues that we're experiencing here are unfortunately not unique. People have them across, in you know, all cities, townships, et cetera, across the state. Uh, it's a, an ongoing issue. So the this group in particular, um, they work together. They bring everybody together. They do focus groups. They provide information. They represent the municipalities at rate cases when DTE goes to the Michigan Public Services Commission and wants to increase the rates, um, indicating that they're going to invest in a greater infrastructure to improve reliability that kind of thing. Um, they also deal with city-specific issues, such as the rates that we would be charged for city street lighting. Um, one of the things currently that they're working on is the conversion of uh, street lights to LED. Now, while we've started doing that in Birmingham, many communities haven't. And, and I can tell you from my work with DTE over the past 20 years, they wanted nothing to do with this. 15, 20 years ago. Oh, this is never going to happen. And this has been an ongoing problem, getting them to move forward and move to modern technology or different technology and change their processes. They seem to do the same thing and with the same, they do the same thing, the same process with the same outcome every time, and we need a little more oversight. So I do have two, rep oh, two representatives from the My Maui group here. We have Valerie Brader in person to speak. She is counsel for the My Maui group, and we also have their executive director, Rick Bunch, who is on Zoom, I hope. I don't have access to Zoom, but he said that he would be. Um, <clears throat> and they can tell you a little bit about what they do in terms of helping municipalities to deal with this issue while we don't have specific control over the utility company. Companies. This is a way that we can have maybe an expanded influence uh, over the rates, over the all of the different regulatory uh, standards that are in place for them. I did indicate in the memo, and I apologize, there was a typo. To join my Maui, it is a nonprofit, so we do have there would be a membership fee, and the typo is it says 0.03 percent. My apologies, it should be 0.3 percent. The number is the same, the $3,133. That would be the rate based on the city's total consumption of electric utilities over the course of a year. That's the rate to join. Um, and I would be happy to introduce Valerie Brader to you if you have any specific questions for her. So, certainly, Ms. Brader, if you just want to say a few words. And I see that Mr. Bunch is uh, online. online. Yeah, thank you for having us tonight. So one of the things that uh, My Maui does is basically allow local governments to group together to go before the Michigan Public Service Commission, which uh, does a lot of its work by almost little litigation um, called a rate case where testimony is offered. Um, and we're usually the only folks other than some professional staff at the Public Service Commission who are there on street lighting, but we also take an active role in advocating for residential users, both on reliability issues and on cost. 
uh, to make sure that we're they're hearing that voice um, and and putting in testimony from city officials and things like that. So, for instance, um, in one of the things we've been consistently advocating for is that right now you pay the exact same amount if your street light is on or if your street light is off until it's out for over a month, and then they start paying you a credit. We have said we don't think that's reasonable. Um, it, we've argued this in both consumers and DT rate cases on behalf of local governments, and consumers now has an outage credit where every day that it's out is a day you don't pay for the light till it gets turned back on. And we've been advocating the same thing for DTE and are in this year's rate case in part to advocate again. And that is just one of a whole host of issues um, that we advocate for on behalf of local governments. On the residential ratepayer side, we also um, do seek grants from organizations. There is a, a group at the state that uh, gives grants to help advocate for lower residential rates. So not only are, would you be joining with other local governments to share the cost, which is how it can be kind of so reasonable to go in on these things, but we also um, are able to bring in grant dollars and combine that for a voice. So some of the things we advocated for was a lower return on equity based on the poor reliability performance. And in fact, uh, some of our testimony from one of our um, city government witnesses sort of went through the history of DTE's tree trimming and that they would say, okay, there isn't enough, so we're going to surge it. Now we're going to enhance it on top of our surge, on top of, and to the point that we were pointing out that for the last 10 years, there had been a major storm about every three years knocking out power to at least half a million people. And that each time they'd sort of go through this same routine of they do a storm review, the utilities would surge or enhance or whatever um, adjective they hadn't used yet to say we're going to do even more on that, but they were never catching up. And um, we were very pleased to see that um, our, our work sort of reflecting that, I think, was also reflected in the order where the Public Service Commission did order this audit. And they recognized the history there that we had put forward. So I think we've been effectual and a chance, to, again, to join with municipalities from all over the service area in advocating both for lower rates and for better reliability. And I'm happy to take any questions folks have. Uh, Quick question. Thank you, Madam yes. Mayor. Um, when did the organization start in Maui? How long ago did it was in existence? Uh, so I've only been with them for a few years, so if Rick is on Zoom, I would have to, to go with him at least, at more than five years, certainly, but I'm not sure. 2018, according to their website. Okay. <clears throat> um, so this is, this is great uh, access but to municipality like us to get involved. Uh, it, it's not going to give any privilege to the <coughs> residents of the community to be a members of that. This is more uh, local government, correct? That speak on behalf of the residents. We are correct. their voice, yes. But they don't have access, or they don't have. They would not have an opportunity to be member of such a thing. Um, no, we, we. It is governments that correct. join together because. Um, Governments have special rights to intervene in the DT rate cases, although customers can individually as well. Local governments and um, kept both county, especially as in the Constitution, but otherwise um, local governments, because of both the street lighting and the others, kind of always get in if we ask for permission to come in. The, the thing that I uh, think is important too is while you can make comments and you know, as residents have and, and you've seen the comments get filed, when it comes to determining how much DTE can charge, the commission cannot rely on what is in those comments. They have to bring them into testimony in order for the commission to cite those. And one of the things that local governments help do is take the, the things that their residents are telling them and take them from comments, which are helpful as a general attitude but can't be relied upon and turning them into evidence that the commission can legally use in consideration. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I see that um, Mr. Bunch is now available online. If you'd like to add a comment, Mr. Bunch, or introduce yourself. Well, hi. I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight. I'm, I'm, uh, I've stepped out of a planning commission meeting in my, my home township. Um, but uh, really pleased to be part of this conversation. I, I'm, I'm happy to... Uh, just simply answer questions, but the yeah the organization has been around since 2018, um, and has steadily intervened in rate cases uh, for DTE and consumers and a number of other kinds of proceedings uh, at the Public Service Commission, uh, low income 
residential issues of the renewable energy plans and the My Green Power plans that DTE puts forward. Um, we, we advocated a really innovative way for local governments to, um, uh, to power themselves with green energy that DTE is now offering. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things we can do, uh, and we can do more of it with, with uh, a little more muscle if, if we have more cities on board. Commissioner Baller, you have a question? Yeah, several quick questions. Like, uh, so how many uh, municipalities, first of all, I'm sorry, I want to recognize uh, Ms. Ecker and her uh, hard work and research and leadership on this. Thank you very much. Your letter was amazing. Uh, questions for you are how many municipalities in Michigan are involved? I, I would defer to Rick. He's the executive director, so. So within the uh, DT service territory, um, uh, Washtenaw County and Ann Arbor and Detroit, you know, the, the uh, some of the big ones. We're in discussions with Oakland County. Um, let me see. Um, others, uh, Livonia, uh, Pleasant Just Ridge, a, a number is Ferndale, too. Lincoln. Oh, I'm sorry. How um, many? Uh, between DT and consumers, it's probably about 15 municipalities. Okay, at 15. And, and you, you deal strictly with electric utilities, not gas? No, we, al we also no. do gas. Okay. What What's your annual budget? Um, about one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay, and you, you, you have, what is? Uh, do you have an office, or do, do your people work out of their homes, or what? Home, home office. Okay, and how many people uh, do you have on staff? How does that? How is? How are you structured? Uh, I'm a, I'm the only staff. Uh, otherwise, we work with uh, consultants uh, such as Valerie, who we retain whenever we need to intervene in a rate case. Okay. And just for a note, our law firm, we're a boutique. There are two of us. We mostly work out of our home offices. I'm in Ann Arbor, but my partner is in Birmingham. So just as a special note, we'd be excited to give and have both of our home communities in there. We both did lose power as well, so. <laughs> and I'm looking at your website. I know, you know, you probably haven't updated it in a while. Do, do you provide some kind of annual report to your member communities about your efforts and successes and whatever is going on we yeah we do two things one is we hold a, a monthly member call to mm -hmm. keep everybody abreast of what's going on and, and then likewise to hear what issues are emerging in each community that we ought to be dealing with uh, and then I send out a, a, an annual uh, update that you know reviews what we've done in the past year and, and what we think is coming up uh, in the in the following year and, and for Ms. Ecker, who, who would you uh, be the liaison going forward, or would you would we be assigning someone else to? I think I would probably start, and then we would see how it goes over the, the course of the first year and how how involved we get. But I think I would definitely be probably bringing in our city attorney from time to time, and also maybe some of our uh, engineering folks that oversee like the street lighting, for instance. And you'll and probably I would be the main. And you'll Point come person. back to us maybe in a year when it's time to re-up and Absolutely. say this was really worth it and we want to continue that. Absolutely. Else. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Any other comments? Right here. Um, right here. Brad first. Uh, this, this would be for Mr. Bunch. Uh, I think two or three Sundays ago the lead article in the free press was about DTE stating that we uh, are being billed at one of the higher rates in the country and yet the reliability of the system is way down at the bottom. Uh, do you have any comment? Uh, yes, uh, an organization that uh, we work with pretty closely is called Michigan Citizens Utility Board. They publish an annual report evaluating or benchmarking uh, electricity costs and reliability for our utilities here in Michigan versus others in the Midwest and around the country. And pretty consistently, DT and consumers have, have uh, been among the higher priced and, and the lower reliability. Um, DT tends to have um, uh, longer outages. Uh, they may not happen as often as with consumers, but they tend to be longer. And that's what you're you're seeing the results of that. Um, 
And, and so the question naturally arises, uh, if you're being compensated so well compared to others, why can't you deliver a comparable service? All right. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem McLean. Um, thank you for asking that question. I would suggest it's because you're a utility. Having been through this with the cable and telecommunication, the, the legal guidelines are different. Um, the way you advocate from the public or from community is different. But the real difference is there's no competition. The real difference is these are utilities, and we don't have the ability effectively to go elsewhere. So we are semi-captive, but we're not silent about it. And this is a very good way of getting people involved and excited and appreciate that when they say public comment, it's not just, hey, I'm disgusted. It is a formal process which is elevated and you are our voice, which we desperately need. Also, um, if you bond with anyone from DTE and any of these sub chapters, you will find out that they have nodes and nodes are areas of the system that don't just go bad all the time. They know it is a problem and quote unquote, we are dealing with it. But if we don't see that it changes. So thank you very much for this. This is very important, and thank you, so, Janet uh, and the staff as well. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem McLean, with your background, would you like to make the suggested motion? I'd love to, and I'm going to read it properly this time, too. <laughs> um, I'd like to um, make, I'm going to read the resolution for the city to join together with other local governments and public agencies to influence regulatory processes and utility practices through participation in the Michigan Municipal Association for Utility Issues in the amount of $3,133 for a one-year membership. Funding for this project is available in the account 101-170.000-955.2 do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Host. Any comment on the motion from the commission? Yeah. Any? Yes. yes. Commissioner yes. Haig has. has yes, Commissioner oh, Host. Okay. Well, uh, the first comment is uh, this is nice that you're trying to, you know, turn us into a community of players that use the same utility companies. And as such, I like to think this is a, a start of them listening a little better. And Commissioner Hay. I think now is the appropriate time for this because I'm also looking ahead to the other part where it talks about DTE. But when uh, Ms. Ecker talked about the MPSC, uh, let me read an email I got from MPSC, which is fun. So I submitted, like probably many other people, complaint about loss of electricity. And the yeah, point is, sorry, this microphone sometimes doesn't pick us up. Sorry, Richard. Um, so submitted a complaint, and let me see if I can get the right part. Because of the magnitude of this outage, inverted commas, catastrophic conditions would apply. This is defined in the Michigan Public Service Commission Service Quality and Reliability Standards for Electrical Distribution Systems as severe weather conditions that result in service interruptions for 10% or more of utilities' customers. More blah, blah, blah. Well, 10% of utilities' customers is not exactly a big number, especially when it happens repeatedly, as we've been told. So the MPSC appears to not have much in the way of teeth either, because the other part that goes down to when it's catastrophic conditions, because apparently snow in Michigan is catastrophic. I didn't know that when I moved here. But 26 years of learning apparently is catastrophic. I was amazed. I thought it was sunny here. Anyway, rule 44. Unless an electric utility requests a waiver pursuant to part five of these rules, an electric utility that fails to restore service to a customer within 120 hours after an interruption that occurred during the course of catastrophic conditions shall provide to any affected customer, blah, 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 the credit. So what Ms. Ecker mentioned in her letter here about the $35 is currently $25, and there's going to be a lot of disappointed people because I was told that I was out for 90 hours, so suck it. Basically. So MPSC have no teeth. So it's about time somebody did something about it. So this is good. Hopefully we can actually give them some teeth because DTE basically told us to go suck wind because it wasn't 120 hours because apparently snow is catastrophic. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Hag, for that colorful comment. Um, so uh, any comments from the public on the motion? Okay. So, uh, I see none in the room, I see none online. Um, Ms. Woods, would you please call the roll? 
Uh, Commissioner Baller? Yes. Commissioner Schaefer? Yes. Commissioner Boutros? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McLean? Yes. Com Commissioner Host? Yes. Mayor Long? Yes. Commissioner Hag? Yes. So, uh, my Maui, we are uh, pleased to join you and add, uh, I hope, some weight and to your efforts with uh, Birmingham joining on. And uh, thank you for your work. All right, we now move to commission items for future discussion. A motion is required to bring the item up for future discussion at the next reasonable agenda. No discussion on the topic will happen tonight. I would like to start by asking um, the city manager um, what we need to undertake to uh, have the city <coughs> begin the process of looking at the property at um, Northeast Lincoln and Eden and um, having that zoning change to public property. <clears throat> Actually, um, the planning director uh, mentioned to me that he is going to initiate that based on the comments that I made from the last meeting. Um, I think the, the visit to the history of the community and specifically to that property, I think warrants a change to the designation to PP or public property on that property. So okay. Mr. Is Nick still here? No, he left. He's on so Zoom. Then, Thank you. But, but he's that, on Zoom. Yeah, but that's that's what our discussion was, so that that would be brought forward during that public hearing. All right. May I so, ask a question on that? Uh, certainly, Commissioner Hay. Specific to that. Isn't this park on tomorrow's Parks and Rec agenda for parking? that was not clarified to us last meeting? I can't respond to that at this point. I don't know. I think there is something I'm, I'm looking for, but I thought there was a comment or I heard something about that space being requested to use for eight parking spaces. As I noted during the, the discussion, there's two things that I think um, has been discussed by engineering and EPS with the potential of having both a northbound and a southbound bike lane on Eaton, that will take away parking spaces. And so the thought was that that parcel being one of the few public parcels should be looked at at a minimum um, to maybe consider parking spaces there. I don't think that was intended to mean that it would be a complete surface parking lot and the other issue is if you're familiar with that property that property tends to hold a fair amount of storm water and right. I think the 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 discussion was that uh, maybe some level of retention kind of structure may be uh, built in that area which should improve the conditions for both the single uh, family residential neighborhood depending on the specifics and the direction of flow and all those issues, which, um, you know, I don't have in front of me to tell you what the design would be. And, and would also potentially benefit that area northeast. But I think it's pretty clear that, based on the review of the history that uh, was put forth, that that was intended to be kept as public property and um, included in the transfer. As you recall, my comment was that we essentially picked that up from a tax forfeiture sale mm -hmm. from the state of Michigan. So, and the intent was to keep it public. Okay. So the city's moving forward on moving it to public property, and then other discussions may happen in other places, which will be either forwarded to us or not forwarded to us for our decisions. Ultimately, it's my view that the city commission would have to approve how that property was used one way or another. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. All right, uh, other commissioners who have items that they'd like to uh, bring forward for future discussion? Commissioner Thank Baller? You. hate to be a broken record, <clears throat> and I know that uh, this is not necessarily anything new. Uh, leaf blowers. Um, this winter, I saw outside one of the largest homes in Birmingham, a guy blowing slush with a leaf blower. I kid you not, I stopped. I didn't just witness it. 
I stopped and spoke to him. They've started. Uh, I had three leaf blowers next to me yesterday, or a few days ago, for a good two hours. I know we've uh, suggested that the Sustainability Board look at this, and I think the Sustainability Board is going to have uh, uh, its work cut out just organizing and doing all the things that we've, we've, we've begun talking about it, we've gotten a report on it. I feel like we should move on it. If nobody else agrees with me, I'll let it slide. But if there are three others here who agree that we could probably fashion some kind of ordinance to deal with leaf blowers, uh, then I'm all for it. Raise your hand if you're up for it. If not, I'll shut up. Um, Mayor Pro Tem McLean. I agree that it's extremely distracting. Um, how we come up with something that's enforceable is not going to be easy. That's my only concern. Other than we ask our neighbors not to do it at 6 a.m. or 10 p.m. Got to start somewhere. Yeah. If it helps, just because you know I'm an engineer and I like to experiment. So I bought an electric leaf blower of the same CFM rating as one of my gas ones. I haven't had the chance to really try them next to each other very much, but I wanted to see how effective they are side by side. So I have, I'm trying an engineering experiment. It's quiet. It's well, quiet. other than that, and I, they want work. To, I want to measure the and effect. And they're professional grade. So really, I mean, it, it's whether there are four people sitting here who want to move this forward or you're just happy to let it play out. It's going to be another year at least, guaranteed. At the Sustainability Board? Let them do their job. I, I, I believe we had so discussion right. before. So I, it, I, seem, I think the consensus seems to be to let the Sustainability Board look at whether they, perhaps we can um, let them know that. Um, We're going to wear earplugs. That that is uh, <clears throat> so of a particular interest. All right. Uh, any, Are we? I think I think from this meeting and Mr. Dupuy listening, uh, I think that they'll know that that is a particular interest. Absolutely. Ms. Ecker listening. Okay. Um, so um, other uh, items for future discussion. Okay, seeing none. Uh, we move to commission items on discussion from a prior meeting. The first one is discussion on administering a foundation or charity. So we have so, a letter from Ms. Kucherik. Yes, back in uh, December of 2021 at that meeting, I was asked to um, give thoughts or opinion and direction regarding the city creating its own foundation or charity. Um, I recommended that that's not the best practice for the city to undertake the endeavor itself, but would you know, encourage uh, residents to get together and create such a, a foundation. I think there has been a second question as to whether or not an elected official or um, a different people from the city, employees, um, etc., could ever serve on other foundation boards or 501c3s. Um, and based upon my research, I don't see anything precluding that. So commissioners can only be appointed on boards or committees that are specifically allowed under charter or ordinance. Otherwise, elected officials don't sit on those boards. I'm speaking of private 501c3s. Commissioner Waller. Okay, so I brought this up because anybody out there who is thinking about setting up a foundation probably would like to know that the city for sure, for sure, ain't gonna get involved in something like this. And so while we received uh, Mr. Kucharik's advice, I think we ought to uh, take a very quick small action on it if we agree with it. We ought to rec uh, uh, formally receive the, the, the correspondence and, and, and maybe what we could resolve that, this, that in the foreseeable future the city has no intention of creating a foundation. Is that acceptable to you, Ms. Couture? Mm -hmm. All right, is, so yes. Commissioner Baller, you've made a motion. Yes. Do you second. Make a second by Commissioner uh, Mayor Potomac McLean. Any discussion of the motion at the commission? Is that clear what that means? Yes. 
All right. Any discussion from the public on the motion? Uh, I see none in the room and none online. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. All right. Uh, I, I would <coughs> caution if such a foundation is created that if there's more than three commissioners on it, it now becomes a commission meeting. <laughs> so, no, so we will not do that. So be thoughtful. Uh, City Manager Marcus. Yeah, the other thing is that, that there is a potential for conflict of interest if a commissioner <coughs> singularly is serving on a community foundation that is not city sponsored. Um, I think the commission understands that, but to make sure that, you know, it isn't just a free reign to, to get involved in every decision of a community foundation, it may once in a while run up against the role of a city commissioner. Okay. If this so comes noted. to pass and there's someone interested, I, I would like uh, the opportunity to have a, a more full discussion to Mr. Marcus's points. We would look at the ethics board, I mean, excuse me, ethics ordinance and make sure that if that were to occur, the commissioner is clear about what they need to do and say to make sure that um, you run along the, the line of the ethics ordinance. So let's see what happens, let's see what plays out, but please, if something like that happens, have the conversation ahead of time, um, not after. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that, Ms. Kucherik. Uh, the next item is discussion on policy for sponsoring and administering events. Me. Uh, Commissioner Baller. Uh, so this is step two in the process, I think. The first step was to get your approval to even have a discussion. Uh, this step, I think, is to sort of give some... Uh, background and and uh, and and if you if, if we feel like uh, we should direct the administration to do something or not the, the notion is that uh, well the current situation is that we have a BSD that does run some events uh, and those events are primarily driven by the BSD and and that's a, a tax funded organization uh, property owners in the central business district so they're not uh, much interested in you know uh, doing things in Kenning Park or Poppleton Park or any of the other parks uh, that aren't near the C CBD um, we also have the Parks and Rec Department uh, of course runs the ice arena and does uh, the, some programming there and also uh, runs the uh, concerts in the park on Wednesdays in Shane Park. So there's some precedent for the city being involved in one way or another in administering events. The policy right now is, I think, and I can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, city manager, that uh, we're not going to, the city, apart from the BSD, the BSD is, does whatever they want, but uh, the city isn't going to necessarily administer any new events that uh, they are quite happy to uh, grease the skids and make sure, uh, you know, en enable, as we saw tonight, outside organizations to come in. The problem, as I see it, is that uh, we have a lot of untapped potential. Um, and there are communities, and we could find them, that have effective, very effective events offices uh, and they make use of uh, their facilities so whether it's uh, events in our parks or in our neighborhoods and are in our streets uh, I just think we ought to think about this a little bit more uh, because uh, you know otherwise we're it's really just chance whether in an organization like uh, the one tonight comes forward and does something and if they don't, it's not going to happen. Um, I just say, uh, I've been working with some folks who are very interested in events, but you know, we're all just sort of part timers. And uh, one of the key people uh, that was involved up till now today told me he's 
just too busy. He doesn't have the bandwidth, so he's not going to get involved. Uh, Ms. Ecker uh, had participated in a meeting uh, last spring, summer, with, uh, the, with the music hall. Two representatives of the music hall came up, said they were absolutely willing to uh, do programming up here for us. Uh, we'd have to pay for it, of course. But uh, they're really plugged in to the entertainment scene at all levels uh, and could do something like that. But, you know, who's going to, who's, who's going to do that up here? Uh, it, it involves uh, raising money uh, and, and uh, you know, and, and running the thing. So it's something I think we ought to talk about. We ought to talk about you know, how much would it cost? to have an, an office, a person who did something. What would they do? What are some, what are, do some other communities that have events, uh, offices do? And I do believe that uh, some of this is in the 2040 plan. Uh, there's a suggestion in there that, that, we, uh, that, we, that we have an events, well, I don't know what you want to call it, an office or events coordinator. Um, Something to talk about. At so you're interested in a, a motion to discuss at a future meeting, um, looking at how other communities uh, handle programming in their public spaces, who's responsible for it, how it gets paid for, and then trying to figure out how we might create some sort of a structure sure. here. Along, along with, uh, I mean, my little group has come up with a whole bunch of potential events. Um, we sort of have an inventory of organizations that, that could be involved. The city wouldn't be all alone in this. Um, right. So, yes. But, it, I, yes, but the, issue, the issue becomes um, who is the applicant on the special event permit, who carries the insurance, and, and that's something that a group of individuals can't pull off on their own. So a question about structure, whether it's in some communities a uh, Chamber of Commerce or a DDA um, or something like that. So do any commissioners um, wish to support Commissioner Baller uh, in a motion to move this from a stage two discussion to being an agenda item when the city uh, staff is able to handle it and get it on our agenda? Does that mean the answer questions? A city manager Marcus. Yeah, I think that something that the commissioners kind of left out is that when it's a special event and a nonprofit more normally than otherwise runs these events, what occurs is that they have a cup they have a lot of responsibilities, they have overall responsibilities, but two that I think are really important for you to understand. If the city were to take on that responsibility beyond what we do now, the city would be responsible for the cost associated with police, fire, cleanup, and probably one of the more difficult things to do, securing volunteers. I have regularly volunteered. I have been a part of organizations that have scheduled and organized these events. And what you need to understand is if you shift this burden to the city, you're going to accrue that cost. Mr. Baller mentioned the BSD, and he said taxes. But let's be specific about the taxes, because there's a lot of misinformation in this community that the BSD only does things for their own benefit. They are special assessed their budget is entirely special assessed. Right. They do not collect any property tax from this city. And so they run their events through special events. And a lot of those special events, you know, their mission is to drive business to the business community, right? But the farmer's market doesn't necessarily do that. That's something for the whole community. Correct. And the BSD runs that. Movie night that the BSD does. That's, they have a mission to give back to the community as well. That's provided free, but 
the businesses are paying for that through their special assessments. There are a number of events that we could go to. I look at this community, I say, I mean, the, the, you know, the, I think we fall short, obviously, to me, in, in cultural events. Um, the Shaw Festival or the Shakespearean festivals in other jurisdictions. There's so many things that we could be doing. But it's my opinion, and the very first item that Mr. Baller brought up was this community foundation. And the community foundation should be the place where this goes to and starts to create some of these, these opportunities and provides funding for some of those things in terms of how we run these events. <coughs> so my view is you better really think about what all those costs are that you're going to absorb onto your taxpayers, okay, if in fact you think you're going to be the city sponsor for some of these events. And just understand that there's costs associated with it. To me, some of these events could be great nonprofit revenue sources if managed correctly. We used to make money running the Dream Cruise event to the, to the chagrin of the other cities up and down Woodward. And the way we did it is we, we uh, made public spaces available to bidders to come in and, and bring their sponsorships to those. So we covered the cost, a significant cost, to provide police patrols up and down that roadway and have paramedics stand by and secure volunteers to do all that. So these events are more complicated than people are necessarily thinking they are. And until you've been involved in them, until you've run them, it's not just, and I think Mr. Baller's finding that out. People are, you know, it's difficult to get somebody charged up to take on this responsibility. It's a big job to do that. So just be aware that th those risks exist. Commissioner Baller. Uh, uh, thank you. I appreciate everything you said. I don't think you're arguing against having the conversation. No, I'm not. Okay, good. Uh, I just wanted to add one more thing. This group that I've been meeting with includes uh, someone from the city, someone from Next, someone from the Art Center, somebody from the library, and not just somebody, they're the directors of all of them. And they eagerly come to these meetings, and we're talking about, you know, spon sponsoring stuff, and who, who, who could do this event, who could do that event. And I think the notion here is, let's talk about how the city can be uh, more of a partner in that. I would like to have that conversation, whether it's okay. music or film or art or any of that. I think we should look at creative solutions. That's what people are asking for us for. All right. So, Commissioner Baller, have you have you made a motion? Uh, well, I no, I haven't. Would you like to make a motion? Well, I guess the motion would be to direct city administration at a point that's con you know convenient, convenient for them to. Uh, it, uh, do you need specific direction on, on... I think you need more discussion about all of this and more in the workshop format than okay. necessarily in the okay. decision yeah. making. Uh, absolutely. So, well, then, totally. well, so and rather I, than I, moving it to I a stage three, I will take some notes and, step three. And, uh, and deliver them to you and you can... Yeah. Move it. So rather than going to an sure. formal agenda item, we'll move it to a future workshop? Great. Sure. sure absolutely. Okay. Thank you. All Thank right. You. The next uh, very informative conversation. Thank you. Um, I think we're all interested in seeing more family friendly, whether it's music or on street corners or chalk festivals or any of the other ideas that have been bandied about. How do we do it? All right. The next item is establishing an ad hoc senior services committee. So uh, I spoke about that last time. Um, uh, so this is also step two for that question. Um, and I reviewed um, uh, potential activities that the Ad Hoc Senior Services Committee could undertake, um, clarifying that this would be a Birmingham Residence Committee only to perhaps undertake 
um, as has been recommended to us, a survey of the city of Birmingham residents about uh, needs, senior needs, um, looking at previous board's work, um, looking at current demands and trends and demographics, looking at um, the Oakland County blueprint and seeing what parts of it are relevant to us. So I would uh, like to make a motion that we uh, bring forward as a formal agenda item um, on a future, uh, at a future meeting, um, the formation of an ad hoc senior services committee. Support. Yeah. Support? Yes. Any absolutely. discussion? Any discussion from the public? City Manager Marcus. Yeah, I, this somewhat goes to the model that we follow right now. A lot of communities are running senior services as a department of the city. Our model is to um, work with NEXT as a nonprofit organization that actually uh, organizes and administers those services. That has been a very effective model. As right. we all know, um, the school district has not committed to a lease um, of the facility that's used for NEXT. And so uh, you have given me direction to work with the NEXT um, mm -hmm. team to try and find another uh, location, which we are doing because we have an uncertainty about what the future is of the Midvale site for next. But I have to tell you from an efficiency standpoint and from a cost standpoint, your model is really very efficient for the city. That doesn't mean that it won't cost you more money going forward depending upon what we do with facilities. But like a lot of our recreation, we provide the space and the facilities, and then organizations, nonprofits come up and actually provide it. A lot of communities have recreation directors, they schedule all sorts of recreation programs. That's not been our model. And I have to tell you, the model with Next, previously Basque, has been a very good financial model for this community. I completely agree with you. That's also the model that Parks and Recreation follows Great. with making spaces available for organizations like Little League. And this is not intended in any way to take over what Next is doing or, or, um, or supplant their actions or their programming activities. It's more of um, it, for us as a municipality to become a, to, you know, conduct a survey, look at what Oakland County is recommending things that are perhaps beyond the scope of the direct programming that NEXT does, looking at future trends for demographics, sure. and information we can um, offer on our websites, and where we can be helpful and work more efficiently with NEXT in a, with a defined sense of responsibility, which we don't currently have. Right. And, and what I would say to that is that you have, you have a, a director over at NEXT that has an incredible knowledge of providing senior services and understanding the, the demographic that we're working with mm -hmm. and where the future of all of this is. She's very much in tune. If we're going to develop a, a resolution, whether this is an ad hoc or you know, eventually a permanent committee, I would strongly encourage the identification of the executive director of NEXT to be a part of that committee sure. so of that we don't, we don't get our wires crossed with that <clears throat> right. service. So in the same way the um, the ad hoc sustainability board came back to us with recommendations from city staff about the number of members and their roles I would suggest that we would get that same That's thing what from. I'm encouraging yes yeah. so we would so we're having a making a motion to have that as an agenda item to formally constitute an ad hoc committee um, and for the staff city staff to recommend to us the positions on it and um, how they might be filled and who would be appropriate members thank you so, all right, so with that comment, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Okay, we move to, thank you everyone. We move to remove from the consent agenda. We have none. We move to communications. Our first item is uh, Mr. J. Shell, Birmingham Farms Neighborhood Association. Mr. Marcus, did you have any introduction or shall we invite Mr. Shell? No, I think this was, uh, I, I did share the, 
um, email exchange that kind of led up to the placement of this on the agenda, and I would invite, ask you to invite Mr. Shell to come forward. And he has a PowerPoint that's loaded, so he can start going through that. Okay, Mr. Shell. Thank you. I think um, we've all, uh, from the prior agenda item, understand the frustrations of the uh, increasing frequency of the electrical outages in our community. Um, and not only that, but the increased duration of, of those outages. Okay. Could you speak up? A little louder. Or into the mic, maybe. And, and I think what this is meant to do is... Uh, what, what this conversation is meant to do is to uh, look at a lot, another angle of this and perhaps uh, the contribution that the city of Birmingham has to the increasing fragility of the electrical grid through the uh, continued residential square foot expansion that is uh, going on in the city. So if you go to the next slide, um, the increasing demands on the infrastructure um, we're going to talk specifically about the electrical grid and the increasing frequency and duration of electrical outages, but it also pertains to sewage and, and water. Um, what this is not about, uh, this is not at all about DTE and the regulation of that utility. We've all learned in making phone calls that, you know, the city is powerless to uh, work with DTE. That's a state level uh, initiative. Uh, and, and the sewer or water, this is not about, but the concept that I'm going to talk about um, would apply to, to both of those. So what this is about, uh, the city of Birmingham continues to approve residential building permits while basic infrastructure services become increasingly more fragile. Uh, the problems are uh, with safety, food loss, disruption, and unreliability of a basic service. So what we did is we looked at a square foot growth example, just to kind of prove the point. Um, and I'm calling this the simple bathroom analysis. So I live on the south side of North Lawn between Southfield Road and the Rouge River. And when I moved that to that uh, street in 1994, we had 14 homes. And uh, those 14 homes constituted approximately 32 bathrooms. In 2023, we now have 17 homes. There's approximately 71 bathrooms. That's 122% growth in bathrooms and at least a comparable growth in total residential square foot because people aren't just building bathrooms. Um, on the next slide, this is in no way meant to uh, represent fact, but it's a visual uh, that demonstrates an unsustainable math equation of a constant electrical grid with an ever-rising residential square foot draw on that same uh, electrical grid over time. And the final page leaves us with some questions. Uh, there's essentially three. Can the city provide total residential square foot permitted growth over the last 25 years? Can the city provide residential property tax base growth over the last 25 years from the approved permitted growth? And the final question, can the city provide total investment in residential electrical infrastructure over that last 25 years to support the permitted residential square foot growth that has been approved? Uh, the same could hold true for water services, sewer services. Um, and, and this is not meant to include the downtown business district infrastructure rip and replace spend because we understand in those projects all new infrastructure was put in place um, in, in these categories. So um, I think that's uh, a similar uh, thing that the, the people outside of the business district in the neighborhoods are, are looking for those questions to be answered. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shaw, for that presentation. Um, City Manager Marcus, did you want to address uh, those questions? Yeah, but, but maybe, Mr. Shell, you could stay up there at the mic for a while. Um, so I'm trying to understand your hypothesis in terms of um, what your what the square footage gets you, what, what the bathrooms get you, and how you drive 
your hypothesis to well, what does that actually mean? Yeah, so with, with uh, the, the bathroom analysis was just merely a way to quantify in a small segment on the south side of North Lawn between Southfield and the Rouge River, the growth. That is not a unique area. The same thing is happening on Shipman. The same thing is happening on Bates. The same thing is happening on East uh, Lincoln. Uh, the same thing is happening in, in many of the streets uh, where, where homes are being torn down and larger homes are being put up. And when you're putting up a larger home, that electrical draw is going to be more significant than what it replaced. Um, if you've got 34 bathrooms and then 28 years you have 72 bathrooms in, in a very, just about a block uh, of a street, um, it, it stands to reason that the electrical draw of that quadrant in the analysis has increased significantly because you're building larger homes with more electrical requirements, more appliances, more uh, light fixtures, outdoor lighting, electric vehicle charging stations, um, all while that electrical grid has remained constant over 30 years. Okay. I, you know, I presumed, uh, Mr. Shell, that that was kind of your hypothesis. Yeah. I, what I would say to you is that that I don't think you can necessarily, it, it sounds intuitive, okay, that the more square footage you would use, the more demand in energy and water and sewer uh, services would result. But we went back and looked at some actual factual numbers, um, and I want to share those with you. And Eric, if you've got some of that information that we, that we included both in the packet, but for the screen. Can you hear me, Eric? Yes, I have. Just let me know which screen you want me to bring up. Okay, well, I think I think the first one um, that you could bring up is we, I sent you one that's kind of a colored um, paper and it talks about uh, the larger houses across the country and the amount of energy uh, demand that those houses are generating. <clears throat> So if you look at this particular chart, to the left, the graph suggests that even though the houses are larger, the net impact of the energy demand is a plus 2%. Let me read some of the, the commentary that might be a little difficult to, to get to. So in the, in the blue are the homes built before 2000, and what they looked at then is at the uh, homes built between 2000 and 2009. And what it showed was that the overall increase in energy demand was actually 2%. Space heating was down 21%. Water heating was plus 3%. Air conditioning plus 56%. And I'll make a comment about that because this is a nationwide survey. And then uh, appliances, electronics, and lighting, which I think has applicability to Birmingham in particular, was plus 18%. So the commentary in this article, and, and what I would say to you, Mr. Shell, is that I think through this association and, and you yourself can make the request to determine how much um, our consumption of energy in Birmingham has actually gone up over the years. And I would encourage you to ask that question, and I would ask our assistant city manager to work with our newly uh, named association to see if they can't get that information for us as well. Just let me read, you, read a few comments. Geography has played a role too. About 53% of the newer homes are in the more temperate south compared with only 35% of the older homes. The increase in energy, which is modified in terms of those numbers as relates to the northern climate, the increase in energy for air conditioning also reflects this population migration as well as higher use of central air conditioning and increased uh, square footage. Similar to space heating, these gains were likely moderated by increase in efficiency of cooling equipment 
and improved building shelves. Uh, data shows that newer homes were more likely than older homes to have dishwashers, clothes washers, uh, clothes dryers, and two or more refrigerators. Newer homes, with their larger square footage, have more computers, TVs, and TV peripherals, uh, such as digital video recorders and video game systems. In total, newer homes consumed about 18 more percent energy on average in 2009 for appliances, electronics, and lighting. And I would say that in a place like Birmingham, with the affluence of this community, um, across the community, um, I think you are going to see more growth in those types of areas. But I, you know, my intuition was similar to yours, that just because you're adding more square footage, it would, it would be intuitive to think that that's creating this significant additional demand on electricity and on our utilities. So now, if you could switch, Eric, to the water graph that we have in there. Well, before you switch, um, City Manager Marcus, yeah. I think the other sentence that's interesting here is that um, new homes consume 21% less energy for average uh, for heating than older homes um, because of re new requirements for double pane windows, higher R values for insulation and in roofs that. and walls. Okay, so, um, but let's go to that graph on, on actual water consumption. So if you look at this graph, our 15-year history is showing a direct decline in water demand. And I asked our building official why that was occurring, and I think this is just part of the answer. Of course, it's the efficiency of the um, improvements uh, in, in plumbing fixtures, and in bathrooms and all of those situations. But I think that there's another thing that probably isn't graphed very specifically to Birmingham, and that goes back to that wealth condition. And in Birmingham, we have a lot of people that, and by the way, I'm not real fond of the carbon footprint of some of these larger homes, but in Birmingham, I can show you a number of 10,000 square foot houses that have empty nesters living in them. And that runs all the way through the, op the community. Our senior population is growing. So what you're seeing there is a direct line decline in the demand for water, which kind of goes to your issue. Well, how does that then impact, even with more bathrooms? The other thing I'd say about this population in this community is there's a lot of second, third, and fourth homeowners, okay, that, that they have that many places. Certain times of the year, you can walk around this town and know full well and there aren't a lot of people in certain neighborhoods. They're just not here. And they have the affluence to own a second or third home, but they also have the affluence to travel and be away. And so that might be their personal preference to have all this square footage. You know, I come from a very different background. That's not something I would necessarily want. But I'm not judging how people make those decisions. You know, I think wealth has a direct bearing on that. We're seeing, and by the way, that's not a good sign for our water utility but it's kind of the opposite of what you thought was actually happening. So with a decline in consumption, one of the things I'll tell you as a manager of enterprise funds, meaning the water and sewer, is that when you have a decline in consumption, because the utilities typically have a lot of fixed costs, <coughs> even labor, <coughs> the most variable cost we have tends to be the purchase cost of water, right, for those types of things. But And maybe some pumping for electricity and things like that. But it really puts a lot of upward pressure on the rates, okay, for us to deal with it, which causes another issue. But I think that has to do more with the changing demographic of the population in Birmingham becoming older. And 
Next has given us all sorts of information about what that looks like. I serve on the Birmingham School District Facility Study Committee. In, in fact, they have a meeting right now, and the other assistant city managers over there attending that. And if you look at their population in the school, it's kind of flatlining, which is creating a lot of issues there. But again, because of that affluence element in Birmingham, I don't think they're necessarily addressing issues from the fiscal end as much as they should be. And I would point out that not too long ago, there was a $14 million, you know, projected deficit that caused them to cut a bunch of teacher positions and do some other things that they had to do to clean that up. <clears throat> so all of those things come into play. If you go back and look at Gross Points, Gross Points is one of those communities that aged sooner than we did, right? It was an older jurisdiction to begin with. They always talked about us being the new wealth. I think that kind of concern is addressing us as well. So that's contrary to what you thought was happening. Well, that's you're, you're looking at water, and, and I specifically said that we're looking at electricity. So I don't know if you can... Well, you said water and sewer. Well, the water and sewer, the, the same case could be made. I didn't say is, you know, definitely made. But I'm showing you that it isn't the same case. We don't have water outages for four days at a time or sewer outages for four days at a time, but we repeatedly have electrical outages for multiple days at a time. Okay, so, but all of... Let me, let me read you something else then. So... Assuming that was your argument, I asked the question. I have an individual claiming the recent power outages have in part resulted from the new construction in Birmingham. My belief is that the power outage has resulted solely from the unprecedented storm conditions and not the new growth in either the residential or commercial areas of the city. And this is a letter, by the way, from me to Jennifer Whitaker, who's the manager of regional relations, uh, who I have found to be very helpful in some of these situations when she when I could get to her. Please respond by letting me know if any belief, if if my belief about the recent power outages was either all or significantly the result of the weather conditions. Her response directly to me was, I share the same understanding that you do. This storm was our second largest ice storm in the company's history. With the three successive weather events, ice, wind, heavy snow, causing more than 12,000 wires to come down throughout the territory and a projected loss of, what, 700,000 plus services, the outages were not due to a capacity issue. I will confirm with the actual engineers to make sure. On um, just recently, I got back from our engineers just responded and confirmed our thesis. Outages that are being referred to were due to icy conditions experienced late February, early March. They are not due to capacity related issues. So, and then the other comment, of course, is what I brought up first, and that is that a lot of people that are moving into older houses into newer houses are experiencing not much of a jump in their electric bill because of efficiencies of the appliance they're using. Having said all that, um, joining this organization, I think there's some things that we're uncovering as a part of how DTE operates their business. And so I think that there's like three things that we really need to emphasize. Armoring the aerial system. Um, spending more effort on trying to get them undergrounding the electrical system, and, and then this whole tree clearance. What I'm learning is that, and I think you heard from the attorney from the organization tonight, that some of that effort is being um, moved on so that their rate that they can charge for that kind of expense is higher because it's being done as a part of a capital project rather than as a result of responding to a storm condition. Correct. So we're all learning a lot. The fear I have is the frequency and, and significance of these storm events is only going to continue to get worse. If 
if you believe everything we're, we're hearing about climactic change, and I happen to believe that. So we do need to get organized and pressure DTA even more um, to get this, in my opinion, turned around. Can we provide all of this information? Yeah, we can provide it. I question to what end that has any impact going back. Um, our ordinances control building through zoning and building codes and all of that. And if there is a nexus between those bigger houses and the desire in this community to control the size of those, I think proof would have to be made that they're actually causing a capacity issue. The numbers I'm seeing don't don't make that argument, but that argument can be, I mean, we've had this growth, non-growth political discourse in this town for 45, 50 years. I don't expect it to go away. Uh, but I think if you're going to try and make that argument, you, you know, you your hypothesis, you're going to need to do more research to do that. The numbers I get, it's all about people, and it's all about how they use it, and that's changed. The other graph I want to show you is the population. Can you pull that up, Eric? There's a little chart for population. It's right behind you. That is great. All right. So, you know, when, when we talk about the growth and we look more recently, we see that we're starting, to, we're starting to grow again. But all of these kind of statistics are um, relative to something, right? And if you go back in time, if you look at 1960 and 1970, and I'm going to make a point about these numbers, um, we were what three to four thousand uh, more than we are now, and the point I want to make about that is a lot of our infrastructure was built then and before that got us to that point. And we continue to you know to repair, update all of that kind of infrastructure, and we do a lot in terms of investing in that. So at the twenty one thousand eight hundred. When you now go back 15 years, you'll see that there's this decline in water usage, the things that I'm responsible for in water and sewer. And yet, uh, you know, our population is even less than it was at the peaks at 25 and 26,000. So. Well, and, and, and to understand electricity over time, uh, you know, my business is information technology, and so when we have a data center that was built in the 1970s with a, with a certain electrical grid uh, facilitating that data center, the demands of those data centers is significantly greater than what was imagined when that electrical grid was put in because as the servers get smaller and all of the infrastructure gets smaller, we can cram more into these data centers. That's a big problem we're having in IT today with data centers that were built in the 1970s is that the electrical uh, connectivity in no way, shape, or form can meet the demands that we're putting into those uh, data centers today. And I would argue that homes are, are kind of similar not exactly, but you think of all of the electrical devices that we all use, that our children use today, that never even were thought of in the 1970s. I mean, if, if you're building a new home today, you're, you're, you're going to be putting in a significant uh, number more of electrical outlets than, than a home built in the 1950s had. I can guarantee you that. Uh, you're going to be probably getting a larger amp service brought into the home to power all that. I can guarantee you that. Well, because I, those of I us... I saw the numbers. The numbers suggest that's where our biggest growth is. Right. So, so you know, that uh, doesn't just get to your house, you know, automagically. They're, 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 that comes across the electrical infrastructure, the telephone poles, they're traversing our, our neighborhoods. And without that robustness being increased, you're, 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 it's, it's like taking a power strip and, and plugging it into a single outlet in your home and then plugging 10 devices into that, eventually that power strip is going to fry because you're trying to pull too much current through it. 
Okay, so so the growth <clears throat> the growth in that area, okay, across the country is maybe eighteen percent. But when all categories of usage of electrical are compared, the total net Im impact is a, is two percent plus two percent. So there have been investments by DTE in the power grid serving Birmingham, new new transfer stations. I don't know that they're they're doing all they can. None of us probably are. It's a function of the economics of it all too. But you can see where the the offsets are. So, and I would say in terms of air conditioning, that number is actually a lower impact where we live in the upper Midwest because that's a national. Like I said, we'd have to get DTE to give us the what the impact on capacity has been in our city itself if they can break that out. And am I reading this correctly? Does this look like a 14-year-old uh, data set? This is this is something we picked up off. But so it's I, as I of, it's it looks like up to 2009 this data is relevant. So between 2009 and 2023, I think my point is uh, there's a lot of things that have happened that this does not uh, measure. That's why I said you probably want to make it more specific to Birmingham, and DTE would have to break it out for us. To well, and, and get it more current to 2023. Uh, they, they have that capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Waller. Uh, do you mind a small amount of engagement? Uh, uh, Ms. Kucherik, under communications, do we? No. We normally yeah. don't have back and forth engagement, although, I mean, well, this looks like it's a been a big, big conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> looks like a big conversation. Uh, uh, I promise this time. I won't take more than a minute or two. Uh, is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. A comment. Thank you, thank you for your engagement and thank you for caring. And uh, I'm curious, uh, other than the information that you asked for in your last slide, uh, whether, as your representatives, I'm curious whether you're asking for anything else. And I note that you refer to uh, quite a bit to permitted growth, permitted growth, permitted residential square foot growth, and then you say what this is about. The City of Birmingham continuing to approve residential building permits while basic infrastructure services become more fragile. So that raises a question in my mind. Are you, what are you asking us to do? Great, great question. Um, I, I think what I'm asking for the city to do is to understand that there could be a culpability in adding to the, the, the electrical disruptions that we're having by way of allowing and passing out permits uh, for adding to that electrical draw without recognition for what needs to be done on the back end to ensure that we're not uh, affecting adversely those uh, people out in our community that um, you know are, are just wanting and deserving uninterrupted electrical service. So follow up real quick. You've heard that capacity is not the issue. I would suggest we could look at a, a graph like the one we saw, and a lot of things have come along, like batteries and LED lighting, that, and, and, and an increased number of people who actually don't reside in their homes in Birmingham. And, and my guess is you wouldn't see much change. If anything, it might even be less. But are you suggesting that the residential bird building permits that we continue to approve contributed to your suffering? No, no. I'm, 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 I'm stating that there's questions that need to be asked to, to validate whether that is the case or not. In other words, so you think it could be. It could be. I mean, I, I think, you know, again, I've lived in the community for 30 years. <clears throat> when, you know, we don't, we did not used to have... Up until the Niagara outage, there were none. And we had ice storms. We had snowstorms. We had 
uh, horrible electrical storms. There were pretty much the same quantity of trees. Um, I, I think is the issue. Don't we have brownouts? Yes, you would have. You would. That's in fact what DTE said. DTA said this isn't a capacity issue. No. This is a weather issue, and to the extent that we can get better service out of keeping trees trimmed, because that's where this damage is coming from, um, they could start to abate some of that frequency, in my opinion. But they clearly said it's not capacity. Yeah, and, and no one is saying that the outage is caused by capacity. What we're saying is there's a, a contribution yeah. to. So, so if we're understanding that we're we're in an environment where this electrical grid, let's face it, it is. It, you said it yourself. The infrastructure was built in the 50s and 60s. Those wires don't last forever. And and when is the last time that we've seen proactive? Uh, replacement of perfectly good infrastructure to preventive care for ensuring that that sustainable electrical delivery continues without interruption. If I might interrupt, I see new poles and wire going in on a pretty regular basis around this town. And they hack, but I get around this town a lot. They hack the heck out of the trees in my backyard <laughs> to make sure <laughs> the branches don't fall on but the may, may, I, may I comment? I, I, I also echo Commissioner Baller's comment on how thankful I am. I, I, you're representing not just your community, uh, the your association and that neighbor, I think you're representing all of us here. Mm -hmm. yes. This is very impressive. Mr. Shaw, for taking the time. But just from listening, again, I, I'm, I'm in healthcare, but I'm learning a lot. Uh, today, you gave us a just a, a side of us looking at something different. My understanding, I own a business here, and I had to put a generator. I have a house, and I had to put a generator on it. Mm -hmm. I have generator in both, my businesses and my residence, because I share the same concern you have. But from what I learned tonight, it it's, it might not be the issue that but you brought up an idea or a, a, maybe it's an issue for us to look at as a community, as a city. But I, I believe our main issue is because our wiring system is above ground. And as long as we have a beautiful community that full of trees and we love trees and Mr. Marcus keeps saying as the weather, but what is the weather? The weather is because you have trees and you have wires, and every time a wind goes by, that branch goes on the wire, and we all lose power. I believe that's the major issue in our community right now. And good luck. Can we put everything underground? City Manager yeah. Marcus. Yeah, I, I would say that of all the communities that I'm aware of in southeast Michigan, Birmingham, being the wealthy community it is, you see a lot of teardown, replacement with more square footage. Sure. But you got to remember something. It, the storm didn't just happen in Birmingham. Yes. It happened oh, sure. across sure. southeast Michigan. And there was, I, you know, my recollection is some 700,000 power outages. Not all those places had the growth that's being suggested that we have to look at, okay, it's it's the actual demand on the system and I I'm I'm offering to look at how much Birmingham's capacity has grown in terms of use of electricity. I think that's a much more meaningful stat than looking at square footage for the last twenty five years or how many new bathrooms we created. Or usage by dwelling units, because there have been some multifamily that have come in, and like um, the Willets, for example. Um, so, I, and I think that we heard from joining my Maui that one of the things that the independent audit that the M, um, Michigan Public Service Commission has asked for is to look at whether DTE is actually investing in hardening the system with the rate increases they get. And so that would be an interesting thing to find out because it seems to me that that is a significant issue of where the problem lies. Is, is DTE upgrading and hardening the system in the way that they are demanding increased rates to do that? 
why you're so, out so down so down anyway down. so um, we're I'm sorry we're not having public comment on a communication item but we thank you all for your interest in attending and if mr. Shell if you have anything else to say other than that no thank you very much thank for you the very consideration much, and we will uh, work towards getting those information you requested so now we move wait, to wait a minute. oh what are we doing you asked him to ask Maui and you asked the city manager to assistant city manager to help facilitate our request about usage yes yes about usage. you didn't ask me to go about going back 25 years no I did not okay. just about the that, usage data for Birmingham okay Okay, so now we move to commissioner reports. We have a notice of intention to appoint to the Parks and Recreation Board. We have a additional alternate position open, and we have commissioner comments. Mayor Pro Tem McLean. I'd like to thank Christina for being the third person who jumped in the polar plunge with me. <laughs> I took two clerks down with me that day. We all came back up. So all thank right. you. you know thank how, you for being how here. difficult it is to find clerks. Yes. <laughs> Don't drag. <laughs> well, truth be told, they dragged me in, but we're really happy that you're here. Thank all you. Right. So any commissioner comments? I'd like to thank the chief today for taking the time and tour mm -hmm. us. Uh, I feel like okay. I'm doing the academy class today, but mm -hmm. it was awesome. Thank you. All right. I think sometime after July 1st would be a good time to revisit that issue. Yeah. Advisory <laughs> Boards, Committees, Commission <laughs> Reports, Agendas, Legislation, City Staff. Uh, seeing nothing else, we are adjourned. All right.